All right, welcome back to Observe This with myself and the returning Draven. What's going on, man? Oh, man, I'm right here just uh, excited, excited for this WrestleMania build. It's been amazing, one of the best ever, if not the best ever. Um, And I'm doing my traditional revisit. Now, you know me, man, I got that OCD, and I go revisit every show every year. Um, And I, I, I never told you this, but I actually never finished just because they're so long. Yeah. But this year, um, you know, I shared with you all fair that I took a leave of absence from work to do some yeah. traveling. So I've had time to actually go back and rewatch all these shows. Um, right now, I'm in WrestleMania 34. So I might wow. not finish again this year. <laughs> I might not finish really again. far. So you're at Ronda and uh, Kurt Angle versus Triple H and Stephanie. Yeah. 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 I, I just I just saw that match uh, yesterday, actually. Wow. You know, and I watch them in increments. Up. It's pretty good, you know. It's it's uh, it, it works for WWE. Let's just put it that way. Did you see what yeah, Becky yeah. said about Ronda today? Well, what she say? No, I I haven't checked. So, I, I I only heard part of the quote. So, if I have this out of context, uh, let me know. But she said that when Ronda came in, she got a lot of love early on because she looked like she knew what she was doing. I, you know, her MMA instincts kind of allowed her to be. A pretty good professional wrestler and she and then she said but she really wasn't and it's a uh, wrestling is something that you need lots of repetitions at so i don't know if the rest of the quote had to do with why she got burnt out or whatever but she becky was sort of saying this is something that we do as an art form and she was not good at it but was treated like she was really good at it so i thought that was an interesting comment it is, yeah, and I think that you know they're they're like mudslinging at each other lately, um, and you could tell that Becky's like a company woman through and through. Yeah. Um. Even 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 her quote about events earlier was a little controversial, I think. Um. But you know, to me, every time I saw Ronda wrestle, I'm thinking somebody's gonna get hurt here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It like looks real. Was, <laughs> from the very well, wait, it's not just it look real; it looks sloppy. You know, it, it always like when, when she had that feud with Alexa. You know, Alexa Bliss is so tiny, right? Yeah, uh, it was it was like a it was like a television feud if I remember, and she would just throw this girl with those judo throws, and this girl's like taking bumps, and I believe she ended up getting a concussion out of it, uh, one of many for her by the way, which is concerning, and yeah, I mean every uh, since her first match, and even even when she first showed up, or actually she re showed up at the Royal Rumble, um, it was a little clunky, you know, it was a little rehearsed. I don't know if you remember, but she did that whole finger pointy where it was like, yo, you rehearsed it when the arena was empty. It's so obvious. Yeah. You know, it, it, it wasn't, you, you didn't get that innate feeling that she was connected to the business in that way. Um, the part of Becky's quote, based on what you just said right now, because I didn't even think about that, is the part where Rhonda looked the worst was in trying to fake the baby face and the way that the pro wrestlers learn how to act around the camera. That's the part that Ronda was not comfortable with, and you could definitely tell. And as we remember from her UFC career, when things did not go well for Ronda, she could get really pouty. And when she would come out to the ring, and when she expected to be cheered, and she was booed, you could sort of see that in WWE as well. She got pouty right away. <laughs> and, and also, I think that her entire last run, this last run, um she was it was just a big mess from the get-go when she came back after having the kid um because i don't know if you remember this but she was originally supposed to have um uh, it was supposed to be her in charlotte i believe right at, at one of the wrestlemanias i don't know it, if it was last year it was, was last year that was wrestlemania the, the uh two years ago the la wrestlemania was her in charlotte right but but it, it just never happened you know um she was uh she was in a throwaway she, she was in a throwaway match last year in a tag in that tag match tag, that that tag gauntlet or whatever you know the thing that surprised me about her last run and and this was uh you know dave big dave was on it from the get-go and and i i, <laughs> I, I, I kind of rem i, I think i want to say maybe we had it on wrestling observer radio like immediately or something or it was like right after we recorded that information came out and so we both go oh 
she's going to wrestle Becky in one of the main event matches at the very next WrestleMania. And it ended up being Charlotte instead. And it wasn't even Becky. Um, that, and that's what it was. I, I was. I got it confused. Yeah, you're right. It was Becky. My bad. And, yeah, and, yeah. And and so I thought that was actually kind of interesting that they never went back to the Becky thing. Now, you know, Becky was, you know, Becky, she she had her, her, her daughter and there was some different times. But I do wonder if, you know, it was kind of maybe not in Becky's best interest for that match to happen based on uh, her comments. Who knows? I, I, I'm sure someone will do some investigative journalism uh, on, on those comments <laughs> to see if that's really, but we're here to talk 89, but the reason why we kind of opened with some current events is because at the end of this show, we will talk a little bit about this WrestleMania build for WrestleMania 40. Uh, and it's been excellent uh, though. You know, the, the a, a lot of the AEW hardcores who are just into match after match after match after match the, the, i think they have add they can't sit through these long rock segments they're like <laughs> what's he gonna do something and i'm like no he's not that's the best part of it is he's like pacing it and you you're not getting any immediate gratification you gotta wait but yeah that, right. i think it's hurting some fans brains who are just used to like Give me uh where I, I I where's the shooting star spread, uh, press? Yes, no, I, I hear you. I hear you. And and to me at this point, it's like, you know, again, I, I've I've shouted into the mountaintop and I've gone unheard. Um, let's just enjoy both companies. Like mm -hmm. you're you're getting two different products, you're getting what you either way, you're getting what you want, you know. Learn learn to appreciate one, you know, and and educate yourself on the other, right? Yeah. If if you if you can't appreciate how phenomenal Will Ospreay is, which he is. I actually think he's the future of this entire business, honestly. Okay, um, let, let, let's have this conversation too, because my uh, my solution to this AEW problem, that's not a real problem, because as we know, the business has changed, and it's really about the TV deal. And if they get the TV money, then who gives a crap about how hot they are, how cool they are? But from a pop culture perspective... They're very cold. They're very cold. And I think he is maybe the only chance that they have to break out of that. I think he can actually connect in a way that nobody else on their roster might be able to connect. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to see on Swerve because I thought. And MJF, I you feel, go, still has. You go back to the middle of, of last year, I thought Swerve could be that guy. I, I don't know if this is intentional or not, but they've cooled him off. And now he's got the main event at uh, Dynasty with Samoa Joe. So maybe now we're ramping him back up. MJF is, is another, though. Some would say he had his chance and the product became less cool with him on top. But again, he's very talented and he could change things and go back to being heel. I think he was more beloved as a heel, possibly anyway. So, yeah, that, I, think, I think what hurt him was the, the angle was very convoluted. And and it was, um, you know, with the Adam Cole injury, it, it definitely put a damper on it. So I think there was outside circumstances that affected him. I think that whole, like, tag team that doesn't get along, if you notice from the very beginning, there was a whole other direction that was supposed to go. It was obvious. And, and then they got over, right? They got over, which I don't think they were expecting. And so they just dragged it on, and then Adam Cole got hurt. So there was a lot of inconsistency with the MJF title run. And then he was he was a heel, then he was a tweener, then he was a baby face. Uh, never really had that the, the official turns and everywhere I just described. It just happened. So I think if you give me the MGF or the MJF from like two years ago and give him another run with consistency, I think we're gonna see a whole other side. And and he could definitely help the business because yeah, you know, business was soft when he was on top. But then again, the counter to that is maybe he kept it from being softer. Yeah. You know, so so the, so these are the questions that we ask ourselves. I think I think the main thing here to take away is that you have they have three young guys and I'm throwing Swerve in there um, who could definitely be the quote unquote pillars, as TK likes to say, um, of the business, because his original pillars completely collapsed on them, I think, you know, at least a couple of them anyway. Yeah. Um, and, and Swerve, I mean, what talk about a guy that got himself over, you know, he went out there and just and just grinded away. Did all kinds of jobs, you know, because he, he got primarily over while well, he was doing all these jobs. I don't know if you remember that. And, and he got he was saddled good. with that Keith Lee thing when Keith Lee all of a sudden was off TV and we're not exactly sure why. That was his original partner. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so props to him, man. So yeah, so AEW, they they got they got some uh, some positives in their future as well. So uh, Charlie just wanted to to do this to pop you. He just said, "Will Ostrich get it right?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an that's, a, that's an OKLB thing where um we always used to fuck up the names on purpose. That's where Gino comes from. I'm not retiring Gino, though. I love that name. Well, so but the thing talk- is, the thing is, is did, like that was a, a a Chris Jericho WCW thing where he'd screw up the name. That's where perfectly. I got it from. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and my friends would do that too, but. Also, what Chris Jericho would do is he would use like a proper name for somebody if that was not their real name. Like Randy Orton became Randall, and I have a, I have a good friend named Randy. On his birth certificate, it literally says Randy, and uh, his nickname is Young Randall. So I, I did yeah. the same thing from Jericho. Uh, yeah, we right. do the Randall K thing. We do, and and, I, and you try to keep it up. I was watching a, a a show with you and Big D earlier today. And, and and you try to keep up the Randall K thing, but you you don't use the K. You just call him Randall. But maybe it's because of your buddy, so you're just connecting it that right. way. <laughs> yeah. All right. So like I said, we're gonna talk some '89, uh, March of '89, going through the Wrestling Observer from that time frame. The problem with this time, and and this is actually connected to today's wrestling, because on Monday night we just saw the angle of all angles to heat up WrestleMania 40 with The Rock bloodying up Cody Rhodes. And, uh, you know, we're only a couple of weeks out and back the way that they used to do it is they would do the angle, you know, a couple of months in advance. And then the rest of the way they're doing interviews. Mostly they may do some small things uh, for conflict. But so we had Hogan uh, and Savage as the mega powers break up in February and that creates the match. And uh, on Saturday night's main event, they don't touch. I don't remember if they touch ever until the actual match. What is your recollection of what happened? Uh, yeah, I don't think they did. I, I mean, um, because at this time, you have Hogan is working boss man at the house shows, right, consistently. And Savage is working. He's a heel now. Uh, he's, got, uh, he's got bad news in some matches. He's got, uh, I think he's got Warrior in some house show stuff that's right yeah because it was interesting because i was thinking about 91 when i saw those results but i I didn't know that they were getting warrior he was already working with top guys at that time in 89 you know um so so they're not even touching at the house shows but but just just to educate some of our younger fans back then it was still very much a house show business direction so so you you wouldn't shoot a lot of angles for the pay-per-views first of all they were quarterly Second of all, the main the main income was coming from the house shows. So the idea here is just to shoot the angle, talk about it nonstop on commentary, shoot a couple promos, and in the interim, you're making all your money on the house shows. Mm-hmm. And then eventually, yeah. the idea is you know they would clash on pay per view, and there it is. And like I was telling you over text, I was like, you know, this particular angle only really had three big uh, angles shot for it, right? It was the big breakup in February. Um, it, it was the, I mean, you could even throw the Royal Rumble in there if you want. Um, it, and, and then it was Liz choosing that she was going to be in a neutral corner and that was it. I mean, and then they went to WrestleMania. The, uh, chauvinism in 1989 for WWE is a little over the top here because I think it's on the Saturday night main event show that we're, we're kind of alluding to. Jesse Ventura says that Elizabeth is doing favors for Jack Tunney. <laughs> yes, and and and, and Vadius Allen pops me because he rarely smiles, <laughs> and he pops at that. He actually <laughs> like that. We get we, we get we get uh wasn't it Allen coach? We don't get Vadius Brown because <laughs> yeah. because yeah, he's kind of pro and then and then Jesse because Jesse was known to shoot his own angle. They didn't give a fuck. First yeah. of all, he's wearing a Yale sweater, which popped me, yeah. um, and, and w- which was very um, tame for him, right? It was like he's usually a little more bombastic. Yeah, um, the, bo- the boas and the tie dye and the head, <laughs> and the, yeah, the head things. So, yeah, you're right. It, it was it was it was an interesting, like almost like he like forgot his clothes or or like at the airport they lost his luggage or something. <laughs> like yeah, and then someone just gave him a Yale sweater. But maybe it was where the where they were coming from. I forgot where the where the Starrise main event was from. Um, but but yeah, you're right. He started saying that that, that she was doing favors, um, and, and from the for President Jack Tunney, and and, and yeah, Bad News Brown started popping, and uh, and and that was interesting to me. Hershey, Hershey Pennsylvania is where they were. 
Okay. So, okay. So there's another thing. And it's just, you know, we're comparing a time frame. In, you know, I was, I was 12 years old at this time. By, and, so, and by the way, that was the culture of America at that time. It wasn't just WWS. It was I mean, to get heat. Like everything is about yes. getting heat. And, and, you know, even like today, when, when MJF calls somebody fat, like the internet goes crazy because it's like your body shaming. And I, I'm happy that pro wrestling can get up to speed with, with the time and place, but also it's built in this different way uh, of getting people to be upset at the heel and to be uh, happy with the baby face. So here's another thing that I, I don't know if you saw this, but I don't even remember this when it happened. I think it's on primetime wrestling. So Gorilla and Bobby, they are... In Keep on talking. Of, I'm going to get my drink. I could hear you. Okay. They are in front of a green screen. And uh, the green screen is a, a photo of the arena. And so we are to believe that the actual arena is behind them, which it is not. But they throw to Vince McMahon hosting debates. Did you see any of this? No, I didn't. He's hosting debates between the wrestlers who are in the matches. And so you have the brain and, uh, and Andre Vince is hosting the uh, debate. And then you have Jake coming in and they, they basic it's just basically Vince going like, okay, you cut your 30 second promo and okay. Now you cut your 30 second promo and, and you're done. Sherry Martell and <laughs> rock and Robin are at this, at this debate stand. And, and this is in front of a live crowd. This had to be a horrible television taping. These fans just had to sit and listen to these terrible promos. So you would like I, I saw Sherry and Robin, and I was like, oh wow, I don't even remember this. I want like what what's the beef? What's the feud? I remember some stuff at Survivor Series. Like, what's going on? What are they gonna talk about? What do you think that they talked about? If off the top of your head, they talked about being a slut. <laughs> no okay no, no i see where you're going with that so like, <laughs> what, what like what insults did they you know did they throw at each other no here's the question from vince mcmahon about the debate that is supposed to push their women's world title match at wrestlemania whose corner do you think elizabeth should be in that was the only question they had to answer <laughs> that question hmm. and sherry said now this may be Macho? A foreshadowing she said macho she said elizabeth is the luckiest woman because she has such a great man in her life and then rock and robin said well of course should be hogan because savage manhandled her in milwaukee and hogan was the one that picked her up and saved her so i was like yeah okay you're you are they are both the conscience and, and, and once we found out something about rock and robin later on in her real life that gets a little too close to home there <laughs> you know but but I just was I was fascinated. All the dudes got to cut these debate promos about their match, and Vince explicitly asked Rock and Robin and Sherry Martell about somebody else's angle about Elizabeth. And that was the biggest thing on the show. So I get it. But they he didn't ask the dudes about Elizabeth and who's. No, yeah, you're right. You're right. It, it was it was very much still like a shoving this uh, culture, like you like you were saying. And okay. and as a promoter, he was still thinking that way, most especially in the wrestling business. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I I, I want to go back though. Let's go back to the NWA. Uh, so as we know, Ted Turner uh, is now in in you know he's now the owner. George Scott is hired as the booker, and I can't remember if this is the first time we hear about Jim Hurd or not. But Dave writes a list of. NWA rules and regulations as handed down by Jim Hurd and George Scott. I'm going to go through them. There, I'll go through them quickly. But yes. This is another time and place kind of thing that that can, you know, it will zap folks back in 1989. Okay, first one. All wrestlers, managers, referees, and other officials must be in the building one hour before the start of the card. Bret Hart would never sign with these guys. No, no, he's, he's one hour out. He, he would be claiming, uh, <laughs> you know, the time difference, you know? They like savings. That's what Bret Hart would say. Um, but but, but let, me, let me stop you there. This is all wacky shit, right? Like, Jim Hurd is trying, you could tell he's trying to, like, negotiate with the boys because one hour is not too bad. 
So, you know, these guys are showing up like two, three hours late. So he's saying minimum, please, one hour. Because usually the regulation used to be like, you got to be there at noon and stuff, you know, for yeah. a five o'clock show. Yeah. So go ahead. He's just trying to like negotiate with them and no, compromise. I, I want your your thoughts on this. That's why that's why I, I'm mentioning. Okay, mm -hmm. number two. Baby faces and heels can't be seen mixing in public together. That was kind of the norm back in the day, though. I know I have buddies who were like, I was kind of sure wrestling was fake, but when I was a kid, I was at a restaurant and Greg the Hammer Valentine and uh, whomever he was feuding with were eating dinner in the same restaurant. That's when I knew it was fake. Like, yeah. So, you know, some territories actually cared a little bit more about that. Bill Watts obviously would have really cared about that. So what do you think about that in 1989? Well, well, I, I think about that now even because, again, yeah, you know, you know, it's suspension of disbelief, right? And, and, and you go there and, you know, you, you're, you're in on it. Everybody's in on it. But I think there's a part of the brain that kind of calibrates itself to get invested in that world when you're around this. So, for example, let's say we're going to WrestleMania now, right? And, and, and we're in that vibe mentally. That, you know, we're, we're not dumb. We, we know it's all fake, whatever. It's all a show. But I don't think it would be cool if I go to a restaurant and I see Roman Reigns having dinner with Cody Rhodes. Like, even now, not because of, of the kayfabe thing, just because having respect for the angle, because it, it does take a set of certain mindset as a fan to really get that emotional connection and get invested. You know what I'm saying? And, and people like to throw the whole movie thing as an example. Well, it's the same thing. Like, if I'm going to go see, like, a superhero movie... You know, you, you don't want the movie to all of a sudden stop and, and they fucking just start hanging out on screen and then go back to the movie. So there is something in the brain where do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, and, and I do feel just as a, as a show of respect, um, try to keep that kayfabe. Um, if you're road buddies, that's a different story. You know, yeah. come on. Because uh, another thing that the fans have to understand is that it's a fucking drag to be, especially back in, in 1989. To, to be going city to city, you know, town to town, and, and you kind of gravitate and you create your little circle of friends. And if they happen to be heels and you're a baby face, that's, fuck it. It's going to keep me sane to hang out with my buddy, you know? So in that sense, I think by 1889, it was ridiculous. It was a ridiculous route to follow outside of the show. Yeah. Okay. Number three, no profanity on the mic at house shows or on TV, including use of the word, but ass and then dave says or whatever i'm not sure what 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 else could it be heine was what? heine the other one um also no off-color gestures either on television or in the ring what is off-color gestures like middle fingers probably yeah yeah, yeah. So, so stone cold steve austin would have not gotten over in the jim hurt era no he no wouldn't though fingers. yes and, and i think jim hurt is just thinking nationally you know he's just trying his best to think nationally because like you were saying earlier, I think a lot of these territories, and I call it territories because for a long time, even when WWF and, and WCW went national, they still had that territory mentality, right? They, they were still trying to get heat for that local hit in the front row instead of thinking national, nationally. Yeah. And it's different because nationally, now you're thinking about the kids, you're thinking about families, et cetera, et cetera. So I think Jim Hurd was trying to think about them. Um, you know, he got he might have got a little carried away because you still have to get heat. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have an issue with Heine because that's what you that's what you tell like a like a kindergarten kid. At least when, when I was coming up, you know, you're Heine. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, I, I think I, I think it was a little extreme and it definitely handicapped a lot of the heels. I still don't like cheap heat. I don't like cursing i don't like bad words because literally anybody with no talent i could go into the ring and insult the local teams and get heat does that mean i'm any good no it just means that i'm doing something that that's that's going against their ego the fan base's ego right so or i could go there and, and do the bubble ray dudley and ecw gimmick where i'm insulting all the women in the you know with very extreme language no pun intended um so i don't like that kind of heat i never have there's ways for you to get over where you don't use that you know, yeah. Um, look at Steve Austin. He had the middle finger, but that's pretty much it. You know, other, other than him being a rebel, he always kept it at the very like 
PG thirteen to like light rated R, you know? He he was just smart on another level though, as far as protecting his character. His character was almost never in a opportunity where he just looked bad and wasn't fighting back. Like he, if he was gonna get his buck tick, it was gonna be like three against one. It was never gonna be one against one. He's so smart mo- at that stuff. Yeah, no, the most hardcore thing he did was when he was like, You put an S in front of the hitman. That's exactly <laughs> what I think about. That's the only thing, you know what I'm saying? But he didn't say it, you know, but he allowed the fan base to say it. So that was cool. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh number this is an interesting one. Wrestlers or managers are not allowed to use the house mic before intermission. So we're saving all of that stuff if they need to use it for the big main event stuff after the intermission. So we're not, you know, we're not letting Sam Houston, you know, make fun of whom, whomever on the mic and, you know, because he's not a main eventer. He's not an important match. We're saving that stuff for for the uh, the main event stuff. Yeah, that, that just goes back to the old adage of like you built up your show, right? And, and you don't want to use the gimmicks in the opening contest or the second match. You want to build up to all the gimmicks. And so in a sense, and there's always been that argument. I've had the argument with my friends. Do you like the WWE style of booking where they very much limit the first couple of matches and it's just very much kick and punch? Or do you like that indie style where everybody goes balls to the wall from the first match to the last match? You know, but here's the thing. Here, here's here's how you, um, the pros and cons. When you go to an indie show, like when I used to go to PWG all the time, yeah, you're going to get three or four five-star matches, but how many of those are you going to remember? You know, maybe none. Me, I wasn't sober, so I had none regardless. <laughs> but, but <laughs> my gimmick was that I would show up and I was, anyways, we're not going to get into that. So, so then the WWE style is more like building moments but the, the first couple of matches are there to warm up the seats, right? Warm you up, and then you work your way up to the big spots in the main event and the WrestleMania kickouts. So I think that's what Jim Hurd was trying to do. More like, hey, we're going to save the real heat for the second half of the show. Don't don't steal from those guys. Um, so don't do it in the first half, because at the end of the day, let's not forget that the second half of the show is the one that puts the butts in the seats, not the first half, you know? So, so that's that, that's the rationale that I'm thinking. What about you? So I've asked uh, John LaRocca, my co-host on, on Fight Game Podcast, who uh, he was the booker out here for the Bay Area Indie, APW. And then he also did an offshoot, his own his own uh, company, Premier. And he said, now people will remember from the Beyond the Mat documentary, Roland Alexander. People will remember that character. Oh, I love that guy. I love that guy. So that was LaRocca's teacher. That's who that he was LaRocca's teacher, essentially. No, no, no pay, no play, baby. We all remember that. He, <laughs> and so he said that Roland's blueprint or Roland's thesis on putting a show together is your main event is your most important match, but your second most important match is your opener because of what you said, which is the crowd, you have to get them excited. And then, you know, obviously having a first match and getting them going, you, you're you sort of setting the table for the main event. But in an indie show, like you said, you know, these guys are not necessarily worried about uh, your, your show necessarily. They're kind of worried about themselves at the same time because they want to keep getting booked. And if they kind mm-hmm. of want a dud performance then you may not get booked for the next time you know that that this company is running so it's an interesting thing to do like even today uh you know i don't think aew really cares too much about overshadowing matches they're like if you can overshadow it go overshadow it but sometimes what happens is you see repeated spots repeated finishes repeated interference and i go oh i wish this was agented a little bit better uh and wwe they'll usually have like I don't know how much this happens now, but they used to do it where you'd have a good match and then you have the buffer match to bring hey, the women's down. match. Let's be real about it. That's what they used to use. And then you have your main event. So there's lots of different ways to do it. And I'm sure based on the length of the show is also a thing. If you have a two and a half hour show, then maybe you change the the dynamic a little bit versus, you know, these four and a half, five hour AEW shows that it may be a little bit different the way that Tony Khan thinks about it. Yeah, you know, interestingly enough, like when I used to go to PWG show, and, I, and again, we have to kind of budget in the partying that I would do before and after. No Korean but, barbecue after? 
No, no, there was other stuff after. Sometimes with the PWG guys, which is, again, um, so so, but I used to be tired, uh, oh. Gary. Like, because you're watching four or five hours of very very intense wrestling, and 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 at the end I was like exhausted. And and to me, when I watch Raw and when there's no good wrestling and the promos are not as good, what I get is just bored. Yeah, you know, it's it's it's, it's a drag to see, but I don't get tired. Um. And but but then again, there's that other side where like I never get tired watching the AEW shows either. Mm -hmm. You know, even live, like they seem to just fly by even when they're five hours. Maybe because their characters are are over with me, you know, and that helps. Instead of just watching two generic wrestlers give me a five star match, yeah. I'm getting two wrestlers that are over with me, and so it helps me get through the through the night. So so it's interesting how some shows, uh, you know, the work rate is good. But I get exhausted because it's 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 five star after five star after five star. Like the New Japan shows would get me like that. They get me exhausted. WWE shows. That's my that that's my favorite kind of wrestling. To be honest with you, because because my really my real favorite kind of wrestling is the Southern style, mm -hmm. which has a lot of wackiness, as you know. It's very much a fucking cartoon at times. Yeah. Um. And and, and so. Uh, it, WWE kind of integrates a lot of that, or they used to during the Vince era. So that's the kind of style that I gravitate toward. So I like watching those four or five hour WrestleManias, and I'm I'm cool. But however, some of these rows that could get they, they they're tedious and they're boring to get through. So it's just different shows, you know. Yeah. Uh, all right. The next one is, uh, and I don't know how you can do have Ric Flair in your company and do this one, but no low blows. That was on this list. No low blows. Huh. Well, we also know that that Jim Hurd was very ignorant. We and 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 <laughs> about the business, about you know managing a company, um, and, and so he 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 didn't have the self awareness to understand that his top guy that was one of his key spots, you know. So we also have to think about the 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 how the animosity grew between Ric Flair and Jim Hurd oh, yeah. during that time. Oh yeah. Um, so for all we know, he threw that just to fuck with them. But that was a little too early in the game, though. So I don't think that was the, the main. I think he legitimately just wanted to get the cheap heat out of the way. Because remember, even though in the KLB, we used to say that Jim Hurd was the pizza delivery boy that got a job. He actually worked for, for Sam Muchnick. Yeah. You know, so so he was coming from that more like that sports background where where professional wrestling was presented as, as its authentic sporting event. Rather than the yeah. Yeah. You know, the people in the suits in the front row, you know, stuff like that. So so to him, he's thinking low blows. Fuck that. That's cheap heat. Yeah. You know, get try to get heat the real way. Yeah. You know, um, so that's why he that's probably why he banned it. Here's another one that is uh, probably not very popular. No using chairs, tables or the guard railing. And then parentheses, Dave says those are Abdul the Butcher's only three moves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, again, he just wants to clean up the product. That would you know? not work with today's wrestling because the he fans... wants to do the catch, catch, can or whatever. Catch his catch, can the, 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 the Greco Roman. I, I'm not, I, you know, I I did not ever attend an ECW show. I really didn't see a lot of it because they didn't come out this way, and I wasn't searching for ECW tapes. But I can imagine that that was a pretty bloodthirsty crowd. But the yeah. crowd, <laughs> the, cra the eight, some of the crowds today. You, everybody wants guys to go through tables in every single match possible, which is. Hey, I don't even know why the table's so over. I never got that ever, and and it's it, it exposes the business. First of all, I would rather take a table bump than a body slam. I'll tell you that much right now because it just softens everything up. Also, from from what I've heard, and I'm not I'm not a wrestler, but um, yeah, it, it's just like over overplayed and overused, but it always fucking works. Yeah, and and it's like. If the people crowd goes crazy. The crowd is it, again. It, it's just a, like a cheap pop, and it, it always works. Um, and and yeah, I think Jim Hurd was just trying to get rid of that, and again, taking back to more of a sports oriented presentation. You know, Mick Foley, if he was wrestling today, and he knew that that's what the crowd wanted, he would get the table out early, and then he would tease putting the guy through it, and tease putting the guy through it, and it would never happen. And then at the crescendo of the match, at the very end, it would happen. Like, that's how Foley would work his matches. And I could see him using the table in that way. But no, pe the people just want it. They'll get it once a show, usually. And they're happy. And then we move on and we do crazier stuff. Yeah, um, well, it's interesting because I was going to say, that's how you tell a story, the way Mick Foley used to do it, right? Mm -hmm. It's like it's like they always tell you, like, when I used to take screenwriting classes, 
and and they always say if you're gonna show an object like this let, let's say you show a gun right like in the first act that gun has to pay off in the last in the third act and so and so that's how guys like mick foley bret hart sean michaels that's how they would structure their gimmick matches you know too they, they would introduce the gimmicks and they would just leave them there and then they would pay them off later and that's how you tell a story because I, I i remember when i used to go to a lot of indie shows um particularly like I never went to a GCW show because I really don't go to indie shows anymore. I'm retired, as you know. Um, I'm the Terry Funk of wrestling fans. I've been, <laughs> um, I've, I've been to at least one, maybe two GCW shows. Oh, you know what? I take it back. I have been. It's the GCW has so much, such a big following here. I haven't been to LA GCW shows, but I've been to them in Vegas. And I think when I've been to WrestleMania. But, uh, but the point is that I've gotten into conversation with the fans. And they always tell me, because anybody that knows me knows that I'm against garbage wrestling i hate it i don't want to watch it i don't support it it doesn't take talent to be a garbage wrestler um it, it takes guts don't get me wrong and courage because you're going to get hurt but it doesn't take talent so the whole thing they're always saying is well what what about mick foley right it's always mick foley with these guys <laughs> what about mick foley and i was telling for mick foley every 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 gimmick that he used had a purpose within the match it wasn't just, I'm going to grab this light bulb and I'm going to break it over your head just because it's my turn to hurt you. It wasn't like that. And that's the difference between a garbage match and, and, what, and what I would classify as a hardcore professional wrestling match. Mm. You know? Now, it does get a little muddy because your boy Kenny Omega brought a lot of that to fucking mainstream wrestling, <laughs> which, which kind of bothered me a little bit. But, uh, but Mox, even he, Mox, he, Mox and Kingston. Can Mox, Kingston, yeah, yeah. But, but, but here's the thing. I mean, Let's just stick with Kenny Omega because I, I don't like to talk bad about anybody else. But Kenny Omega has obviously shown through his work that he could he could adapt to any style. So he is to me a great professional wrestler, you know. Whereas some of these guys, like the Supreme, for example, that was from my area with XPW, I never saw Supreme wrestle anything other than, than like a garbage match, you know, or like Nick Cage or these guys that have these reps um, of being like great um, garbage wrestlers. Um, so, so there is a big difference, you know, and, and, and I think, yeah, using gimmicks is good, but it, it, sh it should be the sizzle, not the steak. It should always be the sizzle. Yeah. You know, um, so that's where I'm at with that. No, I, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, we're pretty much in agreement there. Uh, all right. Uh, a few more of these, no more than one man on the floor at a time before intermission. No, so no fighting outside the ring before intermission goes back to what we're talking about. Save that stuff for the main event. Was this guy on the phone with Bill Watts? Or what the hell's going <laughs> on here? I mean, Jesus Christ. Okay, here's another one. No touching referees. Again, where's Rick? This is Rick's whole act. Part of it is, is it? you know, put, having the, the push and pull with Tommy Young and and uh, Dave Hebner and guys like that. Like, how you're going to take that away? That's a psychology spot in Rick's match. Yes. And what about tag matches? The Southern style... Like you're gonna brawl around the ring for a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. you know, the Fantastic did that all the time. Yeah, you know, so it's like you're taking that away from them now. Yeah. Uh, here's another one that's kind of interesting. Wrestlers must dress in collared shirts while entering and leaving the arena, and then in parentheses. In fact, they even want reporters covering matches to wear suit and ties if they go backstage. <laughs> yeah, it's that much, Nick. It's that much, Nick. Um, how is Dave then, to show off the guns in a suit and tie when he's going and hanging out backstage? He could be like the rights and censor and just rip off the <laughs> sleeves <laughs> with that little thin tie, you know? <laughs> um, no, those, those are ridiculous. You, you're, you're not thinking about the boys as human beings because, again, you can't just focus on the on the presentation of the show. You have to focus on how these guys, they got to hit the next town. Uh, you, you know, if you got to if you got to go in your Subas pants and, and, and your little fanny pack, Go for it, man, because my concern is your health, yeah. especially your mental health. Yeah. I don't need you to wear a suit and a polo shirt every time you leave the arena when you're tired, you're hurting, you're exhausted, and you probably didn't even get to shower. So you're going to be very uncomfortable leaving the arena. No, I, I would say do leave however you want to leave. Now, if you want to take care of yourself as a business person, then it's up to you if you want to wear a nice little collar shirt because sure. then the fans are going to see what they're paying for, right? So, so like, like, like to me, somebody like Ric Flair, he's gonna carry himself the way he does because when people see him on the streets, they're paying to see him. So you, you, you don't want to look like like the, the the guy that works next to you. So, so the so the choice should be the the, the choice for the from the boys, not not so much from the office. 
Yeah. I mean, the Road Warriors, Luger, around this time, this is when, like, the Zubas pants are starting to get popular. Um, they're, I think the Road Warriors are even investing in a company at some point, like, around this time. The Zubas company. They, 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 they were co-owners of that, and they made a lot of money from that. They were the ones that would hawk it out to the boys. So that's why it became a thing, especially in WCW. All right. No spitting at any time on either TV or house shows. Dave says, Iron Sheik's only move. <laughs> uh, no pulling down the tights, which Dave says D Dick Murdoch's best move when he's not in Japan. Yes, yes. And then wives, girlfriend, children, and pets aren't allowed backstage. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, that, that, that's that's very. Those are all very interesting rule changes. Some of who, them are very rigid. Who who brought a pet back there to get to get everyone else in trouble? Do you think? Uh, well. Matt Bourne wasn't there, you know, his bears, was he? But they gave him the bears. So. <laughs> yeah, they did. I, I mean, Co <laughs> Cody's got his dog. I don't, the know dog Cody, yeah. I don't know if Cody brings his dog backstage, but somebody brought... Maybe, somebody maybe brought... baby Cody had a dog, and he brought him backstage back in 87. No, he would have been about two, three years old at that yeah. time. Uh, I don't know. Coco Beware was in WWF, so he, I don't know. Frankie. All the zoo animals were in the WWE at the time. Yeah, no, no pythons, Jake the Snake. So yeah, I'm, I'm that, that one's kind of weird. Someone had to have brought some sort of funky animal to get everyone. Else maybe he was throwing. Maybe he was being very technical because of the ring rats. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> I'm just hey, product of the time, folks. Product of the time. Uh, all right, last one. No long distance phone calls from the WCW office in Atlanta by the rest. Because just imagine Dicky Murdoch coming in with a with a with a, a female friend, right? And Jim Hurst like, we said no friends. And Dicky would have been like, she's a damn rat, Jimmy. <laughs> and, and so that now no so, pets. Now no pets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now no pets. Eh? So see, so that's probably what was happening at the time, unfortunately. All right, some other notes uh, in the NWA world that I wanted to run by you. So we know that Tony Schiavone leaves and he goes to WWF at this time. And, you know, got to give a shout out to Tony Schiavone. Uh, I've been really hard on him in the last, uh, ever since he took over as the lead play-by-play -play guy. Uh, he is, I, I, I think he's in that role because he is kind of... Uh, unassuming he's inoffensive he's the anti jim ross because whatever comes out of jim ross these days all of a sudden is, is offensive to people if it's wrong or controversial yeah so I, I i i'm not a fan of tony's work today i know a lot of people like him as like the voice of your wrestling past or uncle tony or whatever but the longevity piece of it i do respect because we're talking 1983 to 2024 this man has been employed now there's some time away from the business. no but wait a minute G G G let me cut you off here there's a lot there was a 20-year gap here because well, post wcw yeah and then he didn't come back and see what got him over was the podcast with conrad mm -hmm. that's the, he, he started he, he's the, the thing about tony and, and and you know again yes props to him for putting himself in this situation right he's like don Callis. They're, they're, they're great uh, uh, politicians. I sort of, yeah, uh, uh, that's how I see it. Uh, I, 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 would, I, would use, uh, I would use another name back in the KLB days, but for this show, great politicians. Um, you know, they take the openings. Amazing. They, they Both of them were persona non grata for years, and they both came back, and they both in power positions now. The thing about Tony is that he, he took advantage of this new fan base that AEW created because AEW created new fans. Which is a fucking pain in the ass because they don't respect history. Um, and so when when Conrad brought him back for, for the podcast, he was very bitter and he was very angry. If you listen to those first few, it wasn't until he allowed his sense of humor, because he's a funny guy, to really come out that he started winning people over, including Tony Khan. And then Tony Khan brought him in kind of like because he was the cold guy at the time, right? He was over and the internet, the podcast was great. Um he he was talking about wrestlers slongs and all that all that <laughs> shit. Um like Tom like Bill supposedly is like well hung. He he got things over on his show. <laughs> and then um a, as time went on and he saw opportunities, he took them. Now he's the lead guy on Dynamite. Um, however, I, to your point, he doesn't add anything. No. You know, he's 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 very good at, at just at, at paraphrasing 
what's already being said. And I, I, I see that I pick up on the con. I'm not stupid. Like I, I know. It's, so 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 he doesn't really he hasn't brought anything new other than paraphrasing whatever Tass or Excalibur said, which is great. It's a good gig if you could get it. If you can get it, it pays it pays very well. And somehow he finagled in, in somehow became one of Tony Khan's uh, best friends. And that's how that's why he's the lead guy. Um, the it, today well tonight I still haven't finished Dynamite, but he tried to Taz loves to call the uh, the arm uh, the arm breaker the the Juji Gatami. Yeah, I, I saw that. And, and they corrected him. Tony, Tony fucked Tony, it up. Tony Schiavone called it the Googie Gatami or something like that. I was like, oh come on, guy. Uh, I, I you know I. I hope he did it on purpose so that they would have this conversation. But here's the thing that I don't like most about Tony. He's your lead announcer. He's the voice. He's the truth for the fans. And yet mm -hmm. every time he's in the ring, the wrestlers treat him like toilet paper. And I'm like, this, you can't let them take your mic every time, dude. You got to hold your ground one time. So I would never yeah. put him in that situation, but that's mostly my issue with him as the lead guy. Like he's just get, he's a pushover when it comes to talent. And and again, for for the for the newer fans that only, the, don't understand what you're trying to say, and they're probably saying, "Gigi, why do you care?" Well, the thing is that the the lead announcer has to have credibility because he's the one that's selling us the product, you know. And and, and when when you don't get the respect, then where's the credibility? You know, like uh, that. Like I was, you know, I sort of use like these real sports metaphors that don't always work with wrestling, but. You, somebody from your youth and and who you respect very much. Let's say Vin Scully did an interview with a ball player. That ball player would never shit on Vin Scully because Vin Scully is royalty, and that mm -hmm. announcer has to be royalty. And now some will say, "Well, this is wrestling. What about like you know fighting?" Oh, baseball has heels. Baseball has guys in the past that have not given a fuck, uh, yeah. and and they'll go out there and you know. So so yeah, and and but to your point, they wouldn't disrespect Vin Scully. No way. Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan is in the UFC. Joe Rogan does interviews with all these fighters. It is very rare where he has to kind of, you know, he has to kind of shut somebody up or something or someone kind of goes off and says some crazy stuff. But nobody will ever punk Joe Rogan because they'll be out of a job. Like mm -hmm. Dana will be like, no, that just doesn't happen on our television show. And Joe could grapple, so he could probably hold his own at the same time. Yes, yeah, that, yes. So you never see that instance where you know Joe Rogan or John Anik or one of those folks are, are ever looking like a, a giant idiot when. Uh, when so let's have TK do his own list of forbidden things as like no punking <laughs> out Tony Schiavone. Yeah, that would be that would be number one for me. Um, and the first or last half of the show. Uh, we do have a question, and since we we are going to talk more current stuff, though we did go l a bit longer than I thought on this on these rules. And uh, I also have the Q and A from the page as well that I'll pull up. Okay, J Boba twenty eight says, uh, "Who's more valuable to WWE in the next five years?" And then he continued to say, "Roman or Cody." I think that's an easy one, actually. That's an easy one. It's Cody. It's Cody. It's absolutely one hundred percent Cody. Roman, yeah, even now. He's more valuable than Roman is today, for sure, 100%. To the business that they do, he's 100% more valuable than, than Roman. Now, Roman, yes. Roman's act still works because less is more with that act, and they don't kill us with, with Roman constantly on television. And I know some fans get their feelings hurt when Roman gets all these accolades and like, oh, he wrestles three matches a year. It's like that's what works. That's what... Does the but, but think about it like this. Think about it like this. This is, this is what I try to tell the younger fans. Um, the, in the UFC, you know, and again, we're always correlating with real sports because in the history of wrestling, it, it's simulating a real sport. In, in UFC, a champion, if he's got a successful year, he's defending less times than Roman is. Mm -hmm. You know, he's defending three, four times, maybe. Um, but even, okay, so let's put that aside. Even, even, Traditionally in wrestling, with Hulk Hogan, when Hulk Hogan was big in the 80s, you know, yeah, he was doing the house shows, but they don't count, right? So because we're not we're not we're not seeing them, so they don't count. Um, so on television, Hogan was only defending what in his early run, maybe two to three times a year on TV, in his later run, maybe four or five. So so it, it kind of evens out. I think what happened, and, and and I and I get it as a fan, I get it. 
we want to see those title defenses on television and they're awesome but you start devaluing the title when when what what started to happen is that when Bret Hart won the title, he's over here defending it against Virgil, yes. against the one two three kid, yes. and I guess that was his gimmick. Remember, he was the working okay. horse champion. It well, worked for him. Remember, do you remember the excuse that they gave on WWE TV for why he was defending against all these guys? No, I remind me. He had to fulfill Ric Flair's current schedule because <laughs> all these matches were set up for Flair as champ. Brett came in and won in the upset, so he just decided to defend and, and fulfill all of Flair's schedule. That's yeah, but then he was, a year after he beat Flair, he was still doing the same shit. So what the fuck? Um, and, and so I think if you were to really do an analysis of the business and the way the championships are defended, you would see that generally it, it settles more into what Roman Reigns is doing than what Bret Hart has done. You know, looking at it year by year, let's say the, ne the last 30, 40 years, you know? Even Bruno was defending at once at the Garden, you know, if that, you know, so because sometimes he would do the tag matches to set up the defense for the next Garden show. So I don't have a problem with it. Like, like to me, that's what wrestling was. Um, now, I will say this. It's going to be interesting with Cody because Cody has that Bret Hart mindset. And he's, he's the one that we're going to see him defend against Jey Uso on a random Raw for the title and stuff, which is whatever. It's going to be good. But... Um, we haven't had that in what I would say maybe because before Roman we had Brock who dominated that title was doing the same thing. Yeah. So we haven't had a consistent guy work the house shows and the TV as champion in about seven eight years now. That's going to be a mind fuck. <laughs> I'm I, I hope that they can keep Cody strong once he finishes the journey too. Once he finishes the story, they got to create a new story for him so they, that the fans connect to, to him being the champion and why. It's just like, oh, he's champ. Now we don't have to watch anymore. No, we got to create something almost immediately for him. And maybe that is setting up Dwayne for next year or Dwayne and Roman, maybe, maybe something. But, you know, if they get to Cody and Dwayne, think about that. Yeah, no, that's, that's going to be great. I mean, to me, if, if, if The Rock is willing to do business at the end, as you know, he needs to stare up at the lights at the end, he needs to pin. Cody Rhodes on night one. That yeah. that's to me that would that's what makes the most logical sense. Now, of course, if he doesn't want to do business, then I, I don't think I would risk that because Cody has to come out looking strong. But but if he does, and he's he he pretty much, you know, he's he's in the board of directors, so he's gonna be around. You know, to me, going forward, as much as his body allows them, he's gonna be around. Um but uh but yeah, I think it's important that Cody set up post uh winning the title. All right, get back to NWA. So I mentioned Lance Russell leaves Jeff Jarrett or Jerry Jarrett, and now he he's replaces, does all of Tony Schiavone's stuff he was doing for Crockett or for Turner now, and Lance Russell is is in the uh, in the NWA. Do you remember pro wrestling this week with Joe Pedicino? Yeah, I, I was a huge fan of Joe Pedicino. Did you ever? May did he you, rest in peace. Did you watch those shows? Yeah, I was amazed at those shows because, you know, I. I don't know how uh, everyone's sort of memory works around this stuff, but you know, as and when you start watching television or you kind of get you're into pop culture, and then there's a moment, there's like an epiphany of, oh wait, there's a bunch of stuff that happened before I was even born that kind of created what I am watching or what I am listening to now, and I and I had that epiphany with wrestling. Uh, you know, probably around the Joe Pedicino. I think Gordon Soli may have been on those shows of Pro Wrestling yeah. Week. So basically what they would do is they would do like a half an hour show where they would highlight all of the news around the territories. This is how I learned that Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair had a match at Starcade, and Joe Fra and Dusty was mad at Joe Frazier, who was the guest referee. And they were supposed to set up a match between D Dusty and Joe Frazier that never actually came to fruition. And then they would just show like from all these different territories. And so I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really WWF focused at that time. And then I learn about Flair and Dusty. And I was confused because they said the nature boy and the American dream. And when I looked at those two guys, I was like, wait, Flair has to be the American dream. He's the handsome guy. <laughs> And yeah. the guy who looks like he lives out in the nature is this kind of schlubby guy. So I, I had them confused. I was confused for a good like three or four months about who was who until I started to get in the pro wrestling illustrated. But so this mm. show, 
would highlight all these different territories. And I just thought that was fascinating because like, oh, now here's Jerry Lawler. Who's Jerry Lawler? Oh, wow. Here are the Von Erics. What mm -hmm. who are the Von Erics? And so you just go and it was like this like little half an hour of uh, just mind bending for me. I was like, wow. No, it was awesome. Stuff. Yeah. It was awesome because again, like you said, that was before I started getting into PWI. Once I got into PWI, it like opened all my fucking world, you know, because you had the top 10 rankings. Oh, yeah. um, remember, they used to call Memphis Mid Southern, which never made sense because that was PWI just making up their own name. <laughs> um, it, it, like, like, like the CWA was never known as Mid Southern, only in the fucking PWI magazines. Um, and so, and so once that was introduced to me, I, I, you know, I knew who the Patriot was, you know, all these other wrestlers. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the first introduction was pro wrestling this week. Um, and it was always surreal to me when they would make it to the WWF, yeah. like, yeah. Like, when, like when the road warriors showed up to the WWF, dusty, like all the NWA guys, all the Memphis guys, um, all the world-class guys, because, um, pro wrestling this week also cover world-class. Uh, it was always like, damn, they're here, you know, and you get excited as a little kid and stuff. So, um. I remember Kerry Von Erich was the big one for me. Oh, like, yeah. when he first came to the WWE, I was like, holy shit. Like, you know, and you tell your friends at school that you knew that guy before, you know? And they're like, no, what do you mean? Because to a lot of the casual little kids, there is no before WWF. Yes. You know? Well, well but, uh, I mean, were you sad, though, when you realized that it was, like, the washed-up version of Kerry Von Erich? Well, that was later. As an, like, like yeah. as I was a teenager, I found that out. Yeah. But as a little kid, I'm just seeing Kerry Von Erich, you know? So do you the modern uh, day warrior what it, I, I thought that when i learned that vince did this uh i i thought it was brilliant but remember when vince gets the all-american wrestling time slot i think uh with uh totally blanchard's father had it i think and then they lost it somehow and vince got it so they're on usa they lost and, it because they had blood they had a lot of blood on, uh, on their show no 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 there was an angle where there was actual animal feces like, that's right on yes this thing so yeah. Early in the early days of all American wrestling, Vince would actually ask the territories yeah. for their tapes yeah. and he would put them on. And these guys are thinking like, oh, yeah, free publicity. Thanks, Vince. It was what, scouting them. He was just seeing who liked who, like the, what, who did the fans like? And then he was going to bring those guys to his company. Like, can you imagine just he's just like mind screwing with these dudes, like just ahead of the game. I mean, in so many ways, right? In so many ways, but it's also like like the hubris of the other promoters, the ignorance of the other promoters. Just this idea that Junior, which he used to hate, by the way, um, it, it has has a temerity to do this stuff. And, and and they were also still working on that handshake, you know, honor among thieves kind of deal too. So so I, I've always said like, if you want if you want to make a TV show like The Sopranos. Use professional wrestling because it's the <laughs> same thing. Like, there's so many stories. Dude. That's why I like reading Dave's bios on these old guys, the Pop Bowsers of the world, you know? Or even, like, the Pop Bosch who passes away, you know, in, in this little um, cycle that we're doing of wrestling observers. Yeah. observers. Um, it, it was just, like, the mafia, and they had, like, this code of, like, not saying anything. It's just always been so interesting to me. You could never make a movie out of it because you need more time. But it would like like if you were to give it like a four or five episode, like not episode season run, you could tell an amazing story. And I think it's a story that would connect with a lot of the casual fan base because it's definitely like it's a mafia story. It's what it is. Dwayne tried, right? He went to HBO and they didn't they didn't do what the show that he wanted to do. I think that eventually became ballers like maybe ballers was like a second <laughs> idea or something but i never I, watched that because i was a huge fan of entourage and it was like to me it's like i'm just watching the same show again and not as you good know? and it wasn't as good also you were a fan of entourage as well yeah yeah i watch entourage i watched entourage later though i didn't watch it in real time i watched it after the run was over and then i went back and watched you know it. what bothered me about entourage and again we always connect storytelling with films and tv and wrestling because there is a, a synergy there i hated that the main guys would never sell because Remember what was his name? Vince, right? His yeah. name was also Vince. Vinny Vince Chase. would always Vinny Chase. His line, his throwaway line to like not get any heat would always be like, "Well, we came from nothing, so we go back to nothing. We're good." And I was like, "Dude, you're throwing away all the heat, bro." Yeah. Like, so that would always frustrate me. 
Well, I mean, the, the the his whole angle on the show was he was a movie star who couldn't act. <laughs> like that was like yes. <laughs> <laughs> and in real life, I mean, he was a very handsome dude. I, I mean, I but Adrian he, Grenier didn't do shit afterwards. Yeah, yeah, he was he was in uh, what was the Anne Hathaway and Meryl Streep movie? Uh, the Prada one? I, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think he's in that movie. And, yeah. Okay. And then, and then I, I I don't know what else he's been in after that, but um. Okay, so um, the fallout from the Chi Town Rumble pay per view, which Dave really, really loved. He was there in in the front row. Uh, Dave says that with with the great production on the pay per view, they've kind of uh, done a very good job of making their current fan base happy. He was very disappointed because post house shows after that giant pay per view, not giant, but after that successful pay per view. He says that he thinks that they're booking locally rather than nationally, thinking small time rather than big time. And he uses the example of bringing over the Iron Sheik as a washed up WWF guy who's readily available to work for them. And Dave's writing saying, if those guys don't want him, they're telling you that he's not he's not going to draw because they've used they, they've gotten everything out of him. And so you don't need to bring that guy in. You actually need to go the opposite way and bring in guys that they haven't gotten to yet or that they, that they haven't used up and, and sort of spit out. What did, what did you think about that comment from Big Dave and around the two competing companies right now? As I watching? agree with him. I, I agree with him. I think, I think how that's reflective in modern times is like when, when we see AEW sign off all the castaways, right? All the WWE castaways. Um, I know that back then, when AEW had a different philosophy and all of a sudden they're signing Mark Henry in the big show. And I was very upset about that. Cause I was like, what are you doing? Like TNA already tried this, you know, NWA in 89 did this. Like you're, 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 you're investing in, in, in talent. That's already what I like to call like TV old, you know, there's other talent out there that that's fresh and, and more talented and you could invest in them. Um, like you said, I think, at that point, and this was before Jim Hurd came, because I, Jim Hurd actually was he he was more in sync with Dave's philosophy when it came to talent. Um, but I do feel like they were saying, "Well, the junk food dog gets over in New Orleans, so let's bring him in," yeah. you know. And and Iron Sheik draws money here, so let's bring him in. And it's like you're thinking national, and in, at the national level, the Iron Sheik has no credibility because he's already been there when he was at the WWF. Yeah. So yeah, it was definitely a mistake. It's you know almost six years since he was on top in in the WWF. Uh, here's an interesting thing though, and and this may be a little bit different about the way Tony Khan does this, and I'm I'm actually interested in your thoughts about this. Tony Khan, being uh, coming from a family that is richer than anything else that the wrestling business has has seen, <laughs> you know, pre TKO, obviously TKO the company and the entity is very valuable. But Tony Khan has personal wealth and his pops is personal wealth. I think he comes in and he goes, okay, who do we need to take care of? Who did the business kind of chew up and spit out? And who can actually help us in other areas that may not actually be on television? Maybe this guy gives us credibility in some way. Maybe we can send Mark Henry to some markets and he is very well respected in those markets and he can actually be a face of the AEW because the big show now the big show is very smart he's not going to say anything negative about him still getting a paycheck and he can't he really cannot do anything he mm -hmm. said this has been his favorite time in wrestling ever as far as the the money that he's making and and such and i i can see that because he doesn't really have to do much right you don't see the big show he do, what does he, he doesn't do anything like he, he got no. body slammed on a car by will hobbs or or, or spine Buster. which was pretty brutal though yeah. i think he paid for the whole year's his whole year's <laughs> salary was was charged right there in that bump you know um but no no he doesn't do much you know, he's being a politician, right? He's going to say that. I think... Um, do you respect Tony for taking care of these guys, knowing that, yeah, you know, keeping this guy employed is kind of a little bit of a... The, the, the OCMIO rule, yeah, you take care of your veterans. Do I respect it? Yes. Do I, as a business person, think it's wise? No. Um, uh, we have the Q&A coming up here in a little bit, and somebody did ask, 
you know, what, what is one thing that TK could learn from Paul and vice versa? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that TK was, that was a big question on Wrestling Observer Radio not that long ago. It actually stumped Dave. He actually had to take a show off and come back and think about his answer. Well, we'll talk about it in a little bit. But, but, but right now, um, I do think that he needs to stop trying to be friends with these guys. And, and, and I don't know if it's something that's, that, that's coming up from his childhood. Um, obviously, he's a fan, so he's always going to have that, that, that transference with the boys because he looks up to them. Um, you, 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 know, you, you know this because you, you know, you're part of a, of a company. Like Being a businessman is different than trying to be somebody's friend. You know, Being a businessman, you're looking at the corporation as a whole, and sometimes decisions have to be made. And so he, he needs to start thinking that way. It's, ve it's very cold, and, and I could never do that. I'm too much of a, like, you know, um, but, but if he's in that position, he needs to start working that way because then we're going to have situations like what's happened over the last year and a half, you know, where, where people don't really respect him, and, and he's kind of a pushover, and then he needs to be accountable. You know, like, this whole, like, Jack Perry thing really rubs me the wrong way. Yeah, me too. You know, he needs to be accountable for his ship, um, take the credit, but also take the L's, you know, like any, any corporate head would do. So, so to your point, like, I feel like, yes, I respect it, you know, as, as a humanitarian, from a humanist perspective, he's taking care of these veterans. He's giving them little jobs here and there. But as a business person, I don't think it's the wisest thing to do. Now, the, the one thing, and, and the company is still private. So it's all his money and, you know, he can do essentially whatever he, he wants to. But the other part of it, which you said about the relationships, this is what happens in small companies, right? Like if you build a company, it's Draven and his four buddies who he knows are hard workers, but also you have this kinship with as, as buddies and brothers and you go, okay, we're going to build this company. And you go from five people to 20 people. The relationships with people uh, six through twenty are going to be different than you have with the with the first five, and then you take it to a hundred people, and now you're just like, man, these relationships that I've established are are these too close for comfort? Now, what about these? And so I think he's going through this now, which is he knows that he doesn't have enough time for everybody, and some right. of those people who don't get that time probably do feel like he's being cold to them but like the other, for example who just left but the other people and this is a wrestling uh wrestling uh trope in in, in real re wrestling history his top guys he's always going to be closer to his top guys and now maybe mercedes as his top female right because <laughs> you want to be in sync with them they're going to be your most demanding but they're also going to draw you the most money and so you need to manage them from a people level in a different way than you're managing Ortiz or 2.0 or even to the, you know, to the bottom of Serpentico or, or whomever, you know, is still employed with, with him that is, you know, wrestling uh, on ROH uh, dark matches or whatever. But I think, I think his mistake, and, and again, you all, we're always trying to learn and, and, and there's ways to move forward from this. I think his mistake is that he didn't establish the hierarchy right off the bat. You know, he always, at least from the outside looking in, from my perspective looking in, which I don't have all the information, but just making assumptions, he always came off as a guy who, who gave the impression that everybody was equal in his company, which is impossible. You can't do that, especially in a wrestling company. And so now he's paying the price for that, you know? And, and I also feel like he comes off as a guy that really doesn't like confrontation. He's very uncomfortable with confrontation. And as a, as a boss, you can't, you have to be comfortable with with getting dirty verbally and, and setting down the law because people respect that anybody that runs a company understands that if you build a good hierarchy people will respect that and it seems to me that he doesn't have that in his company at the moment so there's a there, we're starting to see a lot of that of the of the company shakeups because of that you know so that's something he's got to work on going forward all right we'll get to more questions uh, after we get through a little bit more here so let's switch over to the wwf side we're building towards WrestleMania and Clash of the Champions. Dave calls it Super, Super Sunday, Sunday, which Sunday pops part, me. Super Sunday Part Two. Uh, and so, on the WWF side, uh, we were talking about the commission last time and how 
they went to the commission and basically said, yeah, wrestling's fake. And and it, it wasn't because they all of a sudden, you know, wanted to stop telling lies. It was because they wanted to stop paying taxes and they wanted the they didn't want the doctors to have to be uh, assigned by the athletic commission. So they wanted to be out from under that. Um, mm-hmm. Dave wrote that uh, in Houston, and and if people know the athletic commissions and everything uh, in Texas, this is kind of funny to me. Uh, at the last Titan show in Houston, Titan refused to cooperate with the commission, locked them out of the building, wouldn't let them backstage, and the commission officially shut down the card. Titan ran the card anyway and didn't pay the taxes on the show. While there was talk of disciplinary action taking place because of this, it appears none will actually take place. WWF throws the middle finger at the Texas Athletic Commission, who wanted their cut from the house show, and they were able to kind of bully them. Well, again, the, and, and, and the entire the entire um, companies, all the companies, the entire industry, I should say, they're still very much in that very regional. You know, I could buy off the cops if I want to to protect Jimmy Snuka. You know, uh, kind of mindset. You know, and so I think Vince, even even here, we're, we're four or five years into the national expansion, he's still thinking that he's in Connecticut or New York and he still has these guys in his pocket, but he gets away with it because I think that, well, well, like you said, you know, the Texas commissions tend to be very shady, but they're also thinking, what the fuck just happened? Yeah. And, and, and by the time they make sense of it, Vince already packed up his circus and it's on to the next town, you know? So, so, so I think that's what was going on. And, and I think, Unfortunately, to this day, Vince just never grew out of that ever. He never grew out of that mentality, you know, which is yeah. which is sad. All right. Uh, the other thing that Dave mentions about the commission is that he thinks the other piece of why WWE doesn't want to work with athletic commissions is it might also be related to steroids because they don't want athletic commissions coming in and doing any steroids testing. Now, this comes off of the heels of the NFL in 1989 having to start doing steroid testing because of a couple of players having some heart issues that uh, come out uh, uh, and in Sports Illustrated and, and such. So I thought that was interesting. In 1989, all the way back then, uh, you know, in, in, in pop culture or in sports parlance, 1989 is... The Bash Brothers with the Oakland A's, Mark McGuire and Jose Canseco. Yes, your your boys. Oh my God, they destroyed my boys in the World Series that year. <laughs> that, uh, but like, that's why when I was twelve years old or thirteen years old, I was like, yeah, I know what steroids are because I know based on pro wrestling. And then it's in baseball. So how are how's Bud Selig going to tell me that he didn't know that steroids were in baseball? I'm like, I knew because of pro wrestling. Everybody knew. Before. Yeah, everybody knew. They're in football. They did steroid testing in football in 1989. The long okay. ball draws money is the problem. Chicks dig the long ball. That's what yes. Yeah, the, the, the old adage is right. <laughs> um, but, but but going back to the commission thing, and and they brings this up, uh, this idea of like, okay, forget all about. Yeah, we know it's fake and all that, but people still get hurt in the ring, yeah. you know. And because of the the drug use, a.e., the steroid use. Like there is going to be high blood pressure, there is going to be heart problems, and, and Dave's point is like we got to get in front of this, so we do need like a physician at ringside, or else it could lead to some issues, right? And and uh, you know later on down the line we do have a couple of examples where wrestlers did pass away because there wasn't a doctor at ringside. So, um, but I but at this time, this is one of those topics that I kind of have read so much throughout the history of the observer that I'm kind of tired of it because at the end of the day was what happened later on is that the commissions that were strict, Vince just didn't go to those States anymore, you know, like Oregon, he stopped going to Oregon. He's like, fuck them. They're going to. So, so, and even, even Jersey, he stopped running in Jersey for a long time. Um, so to me, it's like, that was the finality, either the state loses money or Vince just won't go, you know? So that so that was kind of like the stalemate. The other thing that that Dave mentioned is for some of these states, the reason why they need the the cash to, you know, from these these wrestling shows and some of these this other stuff that's happening, is actually the main draw for them is the boxing stuff. That's where they make all their money. 
you know, these big boxing events, like imagine Mike Tyson, you know, fighting uh, in 1989, who would he, he have fought? I'm trying to even think Carl, the truth Williams or somebody like that. Like, <laughs> like the, the Jersey, they, they would get a giant payday off of that show because of the gate and everything. So mm -hmm. that's really who they care about. But pro wrestling runs way more than than a big boxing match. So you're making money off of those guys, too. Yes, for sure. OK, Saturday night's main event uh, takes place on it. Actually, it airs March 11th. So about three weeks before WrestleMania. But it actually takes place February 16th. So they they have this taping and it only shows three weeks later. What what I was fascinated with is it's literally like a week after the mega powers explode when they record this Saturday night's main event, but they don't show mm -hmm. it until three weeks later. Yeah, again, going back to the way they used to promote things like Hogan and Savage, they're busy doing their own things, right? They're busy wrestling warrior, big boss man and steel cages. Um, to me, it's just back then it was more about waiting the television to catch up to the angles. Um, it, what's interesting to me is that I wonder if they would do local media sometimes and they would talk about the angle before it aired because it's three weeks is a long time, you know, but in your brain, it's just it happened like last week. So I wonder well, if they would spoilers have come out like there's a didn't WWE's uh, magazine actually spoil savage winning the title or it was something like that like well well, well lex luger is the famous one yeah yeah lex. you know but that was years later yeah. um but yeah yeah you're right sometimes the magazine would you know the right hand wouldn't know what the left hand's doing yeah the publication date is supposed to be this time and then they move it up and you didn't know and yeah uh so on this show the main draw of this show even though hulk hogan does wrestle and i'm sure from the rating standpoint that that was the the big deal for the wrestling fans but the main draw from the marketing or from the wrestlemania hype is actually about miss elizabeth and mean gene does a special interview with miss elizabeth and the idea is on saturday night's main event you have to check in because she's going to announce which corner she's going to be in mm -hmm. and she actually blue balls the audience with her answer well she also she actually is also a shit stirrer like i told you like she could have easily said i'm staying home i'm gonna watch on pay-per-view uh, which Vince would have loved because you're saying everything that he wants his audience to do um but no she had to be the neutral corner come on like i would i would have been pissed savage like, would have been should have been boiling at that point right both of them, Hogan too. Like, what do you mean you're gonna be in a neutral corner? What does that mean? You know, I mean, I mean, it was that whole soap opera drama, and I get it, but it's just in real life, she's kind of being a little bit of, a, you know, come on, don't don't be fucking caught teasing us like that. <laughs> so the main event, like I said, was Hogan and Bad News Brown, and so they do this match, and it's so funny because I watched this match after. To my two podcast partners, Dave Meltzer and John LaRocca, are arguing on Twitter about Gunther chopping the ring post on a Monday Night Raw and how Dave was like, how can he chop the ring post and then go inside the ring and just act like he never chopped the ring post before? And LaRocca was saying, well, you know, he's got big hands and like, he, you know, he didn't chop it that hard or whatever LaRocca said. But he was saying how, you know, I could I could understand that, you know, maybe that maybe only doing it once wouldn't bother Gunther. And, and so Dave and John were fret doing a friendly argument and it became a 20 minute segment on uh, Jim Cornette's podcast, as you can imagine. And so, so what did Jimmy say? Oh, Jimmy was in, in LaRocca's corner because he, he's all, he's obviously anti Dave, but uh, he didn't know who John was, even though. um uh, he realized as they were talking about this that John is connected to the website. So he took it as, oh, Dave's bullying his own guys. And I was like, yeah, Jim doesn't understand that we're all friends. And we watched uh, the AEW show at Dave's house. You know, I, I never understand that kind of constructive criticism. I know I, I get the logic behind it, but it's just going to lead you down to a rabbit hole of like eventually you're going to get called out on your shit too because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's wrestling, you know, it's wrestling. So I, I don't know. I, I think I'm going to be on John's corner on this one as well because it's like, I get Dave's argument. I get it 100% and I respect it because he's right. But God damn it, 
all of our all of our favorites are eventually going to do it one day you know okay, so here here's why this match was was beautiful and the timing of it is uh bad news brown rears back and throws a punch at hogan hogan misses and he punches the ring post with his fist in this match vince mcmahon screams he may have broken his hand right does the whole vince thing bad news brown shakes it out and just does one of these and just starts punching with him immediately after <laughs> So I just. But you know was, what? At least he did that, though. At least he did that. I just thought it was funny because it's like, there's all like you said. There's always going to be examples of stuff, right? You can, you know. And, and Dave's thing is because uh, John grew up with, uh, like I said, Roland Alexander. Roland Alexander grew up on the the Bay Area territory, Roy Shire, and so Dave was trying to say, I grew up on Roy Shire too, and they would do silly stuff on Roy Shire and serious stuff, and so he's saying. You know, I, I get I get the Gunther thing, but if we're gonna call other stuff out for being silly, we have to call Gunther out too, and not and just because Gunther's great, he doesn't get called out. I think that was Dave's argument. It was it was it was just a friendly thing between both of them that kind of got blown up. I mean, I, I didn't listen to Dave's argument, but I'm gonna assume, and I think a lot of fans, this is what upsets them. I'm gonna assume that it wasn't because it was Gunther. It was because Gunther was doing it in the WWE, and that's a whole different argument. I mean, you, you know. You know the inside inside of this and john explained this and john thinks that this was the reason that dave mentioned it is when we were at dave's house we were watching the osprey and Takeshita match and john doesn't like the aew style that much it's too there's not enough selling the pacing he likes you know he likes a little bit more of a realistic style so as we're watching this osprey and Takeshita match john made a comment about how he's like, yeah, this is a really good match, and Osprey's great, but I still like Gunther's style better than Osprey. So John thinks maybe Dave was ear eavesdropping on that comment, and then in the back, oh, I see. that's what he thinks. But I don't know. I, I never asked Dave about it. I just thought it was funny. Um, but anyway, that it's just you know we're we're comparing. That is Allen, baby. Twenty twenty four and moving on. Nineteen eighty nine. If there is a guy who is tough enough to fight with a broken hand, though, it would be Bad News Allen. Hell yeah. And and also um it's interesting because he had that rebel character before Steve Austin, right? In that company. But he was like the, the spice heel and Steve Austin was but I mean Steve Austin to me had a little more charisma, of course. Yeah. But uh, you know, it was just a, a, a very angry, uh, anti authority guy in black tights and black boots. It's the same thing. Um, bald head too. Yeah. And the thing about Van News Brown that's interesting is that he was very resentful for years. Uh, with Vince, because Vince promised them this, promised them that. He but, thought he was getting a title run, right? Yeah, with, with Savage. But to me, Bad News Brown came in on top because he came in in 88, a little bit before WrestleMania, and he was put in the program with Savage like right away. Yeah. So he was making top guy money off the hop. And, and and so even up into the big block here with Hogan for their little mini program, um, you know, he started going down the cards right after this, but he came in on top. And I think all things considered, knowing Vince's track record, I think he respected Bad News Brown, and he never, other than the name, like he never humiliating him. Maybe, maybe calling the finisher the Ghetto Blaster was <laughs> was something that bad because Bad News was one of those like very progressive guys. You know, he was very much like there's racism in wrestling, which there has been. That's why he hated and, Andre, right? He hated Andre. He called him out. He stopped the bus and like, let's go, bro. You know, um, and Andre backed up. So, um. Yeah, he so he was aware and, and he was very hyper vigilant about any kind of discrimination. But to me, it's like, yo, Vince brought you right to the top, you know, and I don't know, maybe there should be some sort of compromise and just not taking it as a big L that he didn't put the title on you. But then again, Vince is the type of guy that would be like, yo, bad news, I'm gonna put the title on you. Come, it's like he's such a liar, you know, like straight up liar, too, like not even like discreet. So um, who knows? But yeah, Vanus hated Vince for years after he left the company. Uh, so as we get to uh, the kind of the build for this WrestleMania, now Dave has been, Dave has said this story over and over and over, uh, over the years. Uh, and he writes it in a couple of issues before actual WrestleMania 5. He writes, everyone assumes that it's a given that Hulk Hogan will regain the title at WrestleMania, but I think that would be a mistake. Titan is drawing over all the best crowds ever over this past month. 
The reason is because Savage is so over as a heel champion that he can appear in one city, and Hogan, without the title, can appear in another, and both can draw. They've never had that double barrel lead threat before, as it was always Hogan drawing. And the second draw, whether it was Andre Piper, Savage, Honky, or whomever, might get a brief run and decent crowds, but wasn't able to pull sellouts like Savage has been able to. Anyway, when something isn't broke, don't fix it, and nothing is broken here. Savage, as a heel without the belt, would only draw sellouts when matched against Hogan in the challenger role. In addition, if they did a screw job at WrestleMania, which they can get away with because they've never done one yet, they can bring them back for another pay-per-view in a cage or with some gimmick and then do the title switch after making money on house shows all summer since Hogan challenging Savage in the short one. Short run will draw better than vice versa. What do you think about that theory from one Dave? Miller? Oh, no, I love it. I, I love it. To me, it's interesting hearing Dave uh, become a like, like a pronosticator. Procrastinator? How is that? Pronosticator? Of how things would... Prognosticator of how things would be in the future. Because what, what he's essentially, if you want to look at this at this deeper level, he's essentially describing what the monthly pay-per-views era would become, which I love because he foresaw that, you know? Um, and, and, and at this time, this is like a 30-year-old Dave. Like, he's dialed in, man. He's like, he's studying this thing, you know, from, from side to side and every angle. And, and I, I agree with him. I always, even, even as, a, as a young teenager, when I started really getting to The Observer, and, and we watching these shows, I always felt like it was too early for Savage to drop the title at WrestleMania. And even, even, even when it happened, and we'll talk about it more next month, it was very anticlimactic. Does that yeah. seem like it was weird yeah. because he pinned Savage and it should be this big momentous occasion, but it's, it seems to be very anticlimactic. And to me, it was because it wasn't the right time. You know, I think Savage could have kept the title even up until SummerSlam um, and, and, and dropped it there. But we were in a different era where, where, where as Bruce Pitcher always says, Vince's decree was Hogan must pose, right? That was, that was Vince's decree. So Vince always wanted Hogan posing at the end of every big show. And you know, the only way to do that is for him to win. I mean, they could have had a, a, a DQ finish, but I guess he just didn't like to do those back then, which is ironic. Um, okay, here's what I wonder. I here's what I wonder. Yeah. So we had um, Survivor Series 87 where they wanted Andre to go over. And in order to have Andre go over, Hogan had to take a count out early in that match and then come back to to beat up Andre, who's bullying Bam Bam Bigelow, I think is who it was. Yes, but, and he and, posed. And that was a great angle. That was great heat because you're like, oh, man, Andre got one over on Hogan. We want to see Hogan. And that leads to the uh, the very first main event with Hogan and Andre. But uh, but at the same time, pay per view was still very early in the game. I wonder if there was a lot of negative feedback from the casual wrestling fans who were like, "I paid to get my Hogan, and I didn't get enough of my Hogan." And I wonder how much of that philosophy was in Vince's brain. It could have been, and then he also had that little survey from the year before, right? Because the year before Hogan ended up being out of the tournament relatively early with a with a DQ finish, and then. So maybe he heard the fan base, you know, from that year before, and he tried to rectify it. And then at the end of the day, it could also be just Hogan being a politician and being, I, I, I you know, I ain't, look, I ain't staring at the lights for Savage, brother, not, not on this show. So it could have been a factor of different things. It could be a bunch of different things that, that played into that finish. The bottom line to me is that it was too early for that finish. So as we go to the Super Sunday 2 showdown, we know all the matches for WrestleMania. I feel like they're actually light on conflict, except because the Mega Powers is it just overshadows everything. But even like um, coming back with Andre in 1989, Andre and Jake is a weird thing because what you're basically saying is, is this big bad heel? He has a kryptonite. And we're, mm -hmm. we're showing the kryptonite every week, so we don't actually see Andre really be the big bad heel. We see him fearful. Having then, heart attacks, yes. And then you're putting a handicap on Andre, who is the heel, by having Big John Studd as the babyface referee. So it's almost like it's like Andre has not only got Jake, who 
I think if we all were thinking in 1989, we're little kids. Yeah, Andre is going to kill him in a fair fight because he's Andre. But now you bring the snake in and you bring Big John Stud in. And I'm like, no wonder that thing felt so horrible because it's like a, a, a handicap match for the baby faces. I think that Vince legitimately thought that a straight up match between Andre and Jake, that Jake didn't have enough credibility to stand up to Andre. So in a weird way, he stacked the deck against Andre to even things out for the match. And it, it flew up in his face because the psychology of wrestling is that you never stack the deck against the heel. And this is it's funny how the brain works, right? Because even as a little kid, all of a sudden the heel becomes a baby face because they're fighting against all the odds. And, and that's <laughs> I felt, know, that's I, felt, arc. I felt bad for Andre when I was watching this. I was like, I feel really bad for this guy. He, he's so slow and he can't move. And now he's, the snake is going to get him. Like, he just looks yes, terrible. yes. Now, to be fair, like, if you notice during the buildup, Andre just, and I don't know if it was on purpose or if it's just fucking Andre being Andre, he didn't give nothing to Jake. In all their matches, he just fucked this dude up from pillar to post. Mm. Um, and it was always like a, like like that finish where he threw the snake and then Andre just ran away. Um, but I don't know if it was Andre protecting his spot, but in the entire buildup, including in the Royal Rumble, I don't know if you remember, but in the Royal Rumble, he comes in, he squashes Jake for like two minutes and he dumps him like nothing. Yep. And then Jake comes back later. So I guess that was the way of Andre protecting himself. But yeah, th this buildup was in, wasn't very good at all. Um, I think you have to be a hardcore for like the Haku um, Hercules match because of the whole being a slave thing. Um, really, the only ones that had any promotion were the Rigwood Warrior, which was pretty much just one angle at the Rumble. Yeah. Um, and I believe uh, empowers the pain with demolition because of that double switch at the Survivor Series. Um, that was the big blow up there. But, but Fuji being in this match, um, doesn't it like kind of? Give away it does. What his finish is going to be. Yes, yes, but I love Fuji. He's whacking his own way. So, um, uh, yes. I'm, I'm watching the those debate things that I was telling you about. I kind of had it on the background. And Demolition Axe, he's basically talking to uh, Barbarian and Warlord, and he's like, "You guys are like elementary kids or kindergartners, and we're like going for our master's degree." <laughs> he was just basically telling them they're stupid. I, I, yes. I, I popped at that line. Um, and then in the uh, the one for Hercules and, and Haku that you mentioned, so Bobby Heenan does this joke <clears throat> where he's talking about Hercules and Hercules, the name Hercules, obviously strength and like body and muscles. And so he her, he's basically saying, yeah, Hercules, you're strong. But he was using the word strong as to describe his body odor. And he was trying to say that you don't ever take a shower. <laughs> you have str your that's the way that you're strong. So I thought that was funny because I don't think Hercules understood what he was talking about because he didn't sell it at all. Yeah, yeah. It was so always then, funny with me. Go ahead. No, no, go for it. No, I was going to say, it's always funny with me and, and, and how Vince treated these big muscle heads because on one end, he liked to use them. He felt that they drew money, but he didn't respect them as human beings. He's constantly... Because if, if people watch that era, there was this correlation of the bigger you are, the dumber you are, right? That was always the thing. And, and and sometimes it would be subtle. Sometimes it wouldn't be so subtle. And it was always like, yeah, you got all those muscles, but there's nothing between your, you know, your ears. And it was constant with all these big dudes. Um, like for example, Gino would always say, "Yo, that he he doesn't know how strong he is." He's pretty much saying that he's like one of those like Nebraska like big yeah, dumb yeah. guys, you know? He's, he's uh, like those uh, corn he's, fed he's, guys. They're, they're uh, Lenny from of mice and men. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Um, and, and so, and so I don't know, that was weird to me. Like Vince, what the fuck do you want? Like, do you want that to draw money for you? Or do you like, do you, are you projecting what you want, the body that you want? Like, you know, let us know here. Cause you don't respect their intellect. We know that. So the, uh, the other one that the, the same joke or the same diss is actually from rugged Ronnie Garvin. He tells Dino Bravo the same joke. <laughs> The of course same, same exact one. i thought that was funny but okay so this card now i think historically the consensus was that there were way too many matches and because there were way too many matches they a lot of the matches were, were pretty short but at the same time there weren't a lot of matches that had real conflict and so for instance i think the hardcore wrestling fan the match that they were most interested in was the Brain Busters against Strike Force. But if you were kind of in the know, 
you, you were pretty sure that Rick Martel was actually going to turn um, at some point. Yeah, that was the rumor at that time already from reading The Observer. And, and at the and same time, it's the, it's the match that all the real wrestling fans, the, 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 the work fans. guys want, wanted, yes. to, wanted to watch. Yeah, because I think I think in general, I think everybody, including including the hardcores, we all wanted to see Hogan and Savage, you know, because they've done such a great job with building that up. But as far as like the work rate match, because even you you had Her- Henning and, and Owen Hart, the Blue Blazer, on there as well. Yes. Um, and even uh, we'll talk about it next month. I want to Jesse had Jesse marks out for that match before it starts, but we'll talk about it next month. Um, yes. And so and, and so yeah. Um, so there was a couple matches that were there for the for the work rate fans, um, but like you said, the tag match. Now, what was interesting about that is that Rick Martel had gotten a neck injury right after the previous year, and then he couldn't get back into the country, which was <laughs> wacky. So, so Dave speculates like he's gonna be like, "Well, what about if Rick Martel can't get back into the country in time?" But I guess it all got worked out, and then he was able to get back in, and then he did, turned heel. Did, yeah, didn't he have a partner for Tito? Who was I? For, I forgot if he re- had. They said they had a substitute partner for Tito. Or no, Tito was single for a while. If you see the house shows, he was doing singles matches. Uh, all right, and so um, it guess, certainly wasn't Tom Zank. That's who you're thinking. No, he was before. unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately. Yes. Uh, so yeah, so we'll have that. We'll have the whole rundown of that show. And that's going to be so much fun, man! I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't watched the show. I mean, you watch it. You you at least get to WrestleMania five every year. I haven't watched the show probably in fifteen years. I don't have to watch it because I just no, no, watched no, it. Okay. But I know, but I, no, you I know, know when the heart. last time I would have watched it. WrestleMania 30 for 30. That's when I would have watched it. Because I, w- I was still doing those. I, I didn't I didn't tag out of that until like the 15 or 16 or something. Yeah, the guy didn't get you fucking frustrated until the ball. And then I tagged in. <laughs> but you know what's interesting about that is that we're celebrating the 10-year anniversary uh, yeah. of that show, which is incredible. Um, I had a lot of fun, and that was my introduction to doing all this stuff. So it was yeah. awesome for me. No, it was a um, so, so, yeah, so we're going to do that. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm, it's, it's going to be a very exciting episode next month. So Dave mentions that the clash, the champions card, he believes it will be good, but he says as competition to WrestleMania five, he thinks the card and what they're actually putting on it is garbage. And they don't even really have a ton of stuff, you know, a couple weeks out and they got to sell the, this giant super dome. Uh, and, and, and here's the thing. Uh, Dave hasn't brought it up yet, but I think he brings it up in, in months after. Doesn't it co- and my memory's a little foggy. Doesn't it come out later on that George Scott in his infinite wisdom felt like promoting television and promoting the show was gonna affect house show business? Yep. So he doesn't promote the show yep. because he doesn't want to affect house show business, which is part of the reason why he gets fired, by the way. Um it, I don't know, it, maybe we'll see it in, in the months coming up, but it's I remember something like that. And 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 the show was a complete, right. yeah, and the, and the show was a complete flop because of that. You know, they weren't they, they were in the what did Hogan call it that one year? The the not the Metro Dome. I'm thinking of Seattle. The Silver Dome. Um, the Silver Dome. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were there in New Orleans, which I've been there once. You were there too. No, you've never been there. Huh? Oh, I I didn't go. I actually went to um. I was there that weekend, but I came home before actual WrestleMania. In 2014 or 2018? Uh, 2018. Okay. Yeah, I mean, back in the day, they had the King Dome, the Metro Dome, the Silver Dome, the Super Dome. The cookie cutters, brother. I know all about them. Yeah, they would just, like, you could fit 90,000 people in those things. And you could reconfigure them to different things. Now you mentioned uh, when we were talking about this, and we'll we'll get to some questions here, and then I like to end with uh, the wacky stuff in, that I call only in the Observer. But you had mentioned that you you kind of wanted to talk a little bit about Lucha Libre around this time. Yeah, well, I I, I had brought this up because I thought we were going to be scrounging for time, but just because I'm so long winded, we're doing good. But I'll, I'll bring up a little bit about it. So. In 1989, it was interesting because it, it's it's always like, you know, the secular systemic way that the business works. And really all life works like this, right? Where one one incident, one situation forces us to adapt and create something new. Um, what ended up happening in Lucha around this time was that there was no television. Because what happened years before was that the, the, the commission 
ended up getting getting work because the kids were watching Lucha on television and they were emulating a lot of the moves and getting hurt. So they pulled Lucha from TV. So at this time in 89, Lucha Libre is pretty much a house show business. Oh, wow. And what starts to happen is that from there, and this, and this is going to be hard to believe for a lot of fans, Lucha Libre creates a union. Yes, they had a union where you get medical, you get a pension and all that stuff. Um, and so what starts to happen is that in late 89, early 90, Televisa, which is the biggest company, I think it's the biggest television company in the world even because they own Univision, which is huge here in America. Um, they, they, they go up to EMLO and they're like, we want to put you guys on TV. And the union is like, no, because that's going to affect our income because what's going to happen is that the television is going to affect the house show business because nobody's going to want to come to the shows because they're going to want to watch it on TV. Right. So the luchadors all get together and say, we don't want to be on TV. We, we'd rather do our, because they were working like four or five times on a Sunday. And if wrestling is on on a Sunday, people are not going to go to the shows anymore. So they go, they go and they go to the president's actual house. It's called Los Pinos in Mexico City. And, they, and they're right there with their picket signs. They're like, we don't want TV. And the president has bigger fucking fish to fry. He's right? like, fuck <laughs> you. I don't give a fuck about you guys. So he doesn't, he ignores them. Nothing has ever said. So that disbands the wrestlers' union. They get upset because they're like, why the fuck are we in a union for if it didn't work for us? So EML signs with Televisa, and it creates this amazing boom of superstars that have been unheard of since the El Santo days because all of us and that's where Vampiro comes from that's where Conan comes from that's where like psychosis all these big stars that would influence American wrestling in the early 90s uh, specifically because Paul Heyman exposed a lot of them in his television product and then Barry Bischoff picked them up so it's amazing to me like how everything's connected you know everything it, it, it goes back to like had AEW never existed, we wouldn't have been seeing this version of WWE right now. Like, all these things, because Cody would have never gotten the shot without AEW to be a top guy. So, all these things always amaze me about, not only about wrestling, but about life. Like, how, like, everything is so interconnected. And had that not happened in Mexico, um, and I'm not even, I, I'll, I'll talk about new, uh, Japanese wrestling another day, because they have their own revolution going on with the shoot fighting there and the, and the shoot style. But I'll talk about it another day because we're running short on time. Um, had we had we not gotten that that thing in Mexico, we would have never had the little kids being exposed to them in ECW, like the Daniel Bryans and these kind of guys, and gravitate towards that style of wrestling, which which became a hybrid of the style that we have today. So it's amazed it amazes me how all these things are always connected, even though they don't seem like they would be. Okay, and here's something that is kind of related to that during this time frame, Jim Brunzel claim <laughs> that he was fired for attempting to organize a wrestler's union yeah and, he was and he said he contacted the nfl players association head gene upshaw and he spoke at a tv taping in fort wayne said he told mcmahon the wrestlers are being overworked and underpaid and three weeks later brunzel is gone yeah you know the thing is that it takes a very unselfish top guy for the, for a union to ever materialize because if the top guys are not part of the union it's never going to work because everybody underneath the top guys they're, they're they're cogs in a wheel right you could just replace them um and what happened in mexico is that the top guys were part of the wrestlers union um now later on it was also very corrupt so they were taking a lot of the pension money that's why it disbanded but for a moment in time they had a union because the top guys were part of that union. And so that's why it worked for a very short time. Whereas here in America, John Cena would never join a union because he was being taken care of, right? The promoter takes care of the top guys to prevent shit like that from happening. Um, now, I do see that happening with like, like a Tony Khan in charge. Because I do feel like the wrestlers would be like, we're better than this guy. Let's fuck it. Let's all unionize and not, not work at this at revolution 2028 or whatever the fuck <laughs> and he's gonna fucking have to give us our medical insurance and all that shit but then we're the wwe guys have to also kind of get involved so it's, it's never gonna happen here in this country i don't think all right do you have questions we can get to a few questions and then uh yes i can sh sh close what i have down and then we can kind of go back and forth if you want okay so here's the uh, same thing from jaro bobadilla 
He says, do you, do you see fans turning on Cody once he's champion and he keeps the same white meat babyface character? Um, I think it's very, very, very important that he has challengers lined up because we learned from Sting, we learned from the Ultimate Warrior back in 90 that it, I don't care how over you are, if you don't have challengers lined up post WrestleMania, it's going to affect the title run. And that's one part of my answer. So I think it's important. He better have some challenges. And I know they, they're probably going to do Roman again because it makes sense. But he needs those day-to-day -day challengers, and he needs to line them up. And honestly, I don't even know who it is right now. I think, I don't know, they're going to have a draft, so all these things are going to get mixed up anyway. Now, as far as him getting eventually getting annoying, and, and because the fan base is very fickle, as we've seen, I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. I think The Rock being that cool heel, which I fucking hate because cool heels inherently kill baby faces. I think the fact that he's surviving this, I think that tells me that the fans are, are with him all the way. Mm -hmm. had, had I started to see a little simmer of boost here and there for Cody now, because he's going against The Rock and The Rock himself is getting over, I would be a little more concerned, right? But I don't think he's going he's gonna to get to the point where he's gonna, this character is going to be turned heel by the fan base. What do you think? Well, I think you make a great point in that who is the guy? He's, uh, you know, Brock Lesnar right now is persona non grata, obviously, for obvious reasons, but he's he already had the feud with Brock. Uh, he's already, uh, you could say solo, but solo hasn't won a match in a, in a very long time. Uh, Roman is going to be that guy. But here's something that I think would be interesting. I don't know if you could make this work because then you'd have to get another baby face over. But what if after their tag team match and then after, let's say, Seth loses to Drew, what if Seth turns on Cody? And, and they I think that's what's going to happen. They do a thing there. I, that, that, I think that would be pretty interesting. But then here's where it gets weird because I, I'm assuming that Cody goes to SmackDown automatically when he wins the title because Drew's going to be the champion on Raw. I, I'm already saying Drew. Um, so, uh, and again, they're going to have the draft, so a lot of things could happen. But... I just I don't know how I don't think they've done a very good job of of creating challengers. Like there's nobody there that I could say, okay, this is the guy that's gonna be the guy that's going out that's gonna go after Cody once all even on both brands, you know. Um Alley Knight, I guess, could turn, but see, all these guys are all just like little band-aids, you know. Your, your, what about your good friend Randall K? Yeah, but again, like 20 <laughs> fucking years of this shit. <laughs> um and, and they have the whole legacy thing right so let's yeah. go back to that to the yeah. whole legacy thing so um but it is going to be interesting i will say before we move on that it to me the more the more important thing let's not worry about cody getting booed let's worry about having challengers ready for him that's I what's will, more important i will say last year when i, I don't know if you thought cody was going to win but i thought cody was going to win last year and Triple oh, H, I did too. Triple H actually proved us wrong that no, keeping Roman hot for one more year and having Cody actually do it the next year, it was best for business because he sort of did exactly what Dave was wanting Vince McMahon to do in 1989. He kept the things that were hot, hot, and 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 they they did even better business. So the uh, the thing about that is now. Who you know can can you do it again? I think because this is the the act the more popular version of Cody, he does have a much better chance now of staying over for a longer period of time than he would have last year if he had won the belt last year. Yeah, yeah. And what I like about Cody's character, and this is so important again as a storyteller, he needs to style. And and, and as we saw this past weekend in that phenomenal angle, like he can't be a Mary Sue. He can't be what John Cena was. Dude, remember John Cena would never fucking sell. Like, he was just a Superman of the, for ten fucking years, um, and, and so that gets annoying. I but 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 Cody's a whole different character, and I think Cody Cody could definitely hit hit that hero's journey where he's got all these barriers and this self doubt as he's progressing as champion, and he's been doing that. So I think those kind of characters have more longevity than say like a Superman like John Cena or Hogan were. Hogan was the product of his time, so it worked. But John Cena wasn't, and he always got booed because he never fucking sold anything. Um, so yeah, so let me get to the next one. Yeah. Uh, when Raw goes to Netflix, do you see Cody being the face of that brand and Punk being the face of SmackDown next year? Um, I mean, that's I don't even know. So many because of the draft, so many things could change. You know. I, I think Netflix is going to be the A show, 
So I think Cody's probably going to stay on it because I know you said he may go to SmackDown to replace Roman, but now it's not the same SmackDown that we have now. It's going to just be on the USA channel. So if yeah. Cody's going to be the face of the company, I think he probably does go to Netflix. Now, so now how, do you, the- how do you do this draft, though? Because we still don't know where Raw's going to be after it leaves USA. There's this t- there's gap of time frame. I don't think, and they don't know either. Q4, who in, in TKO's, uh, I forget, it was Mark Shapiro, I think. He was on a, a, on a podcast, and he's like, yeah, you know, we have this, like, we have this space in, in Q4 where we're not going to make any money from TV for the raw brand. And so he was talking about that. And I was like, wow, like what they, they still have to figure that out. But how do you do this draft knowing that raw is actually going to be on Netflix? It's not going to be on USA. SmackDown is going to be on USA, not on Fox. So they really going to have to think this through for 2025 for sure. Well, I think the first part of that is how, where the fuck are we going to be at for three months? And I think they they were very misguided because for the people that don't know what they thought was going to happen is that these stations were just going to give them three months worth of like a contract for three months. And this and, and the television stations or, or, or these apps, they were like, why the fuck would we want to pay for three months? Like, how does that benefit us? And so now they're kind of stuck because I know even Dave has stated like nobody knows what the fuck's going to happen from October to like January 1st. And so I don't know what they do. Do they create a do they create a network just for their I don't know what they do, honestly. I haven't really thought they, about it. Can they just go live on Peacock every week? I guess they could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that was that's what they would do. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I don't know what's gonna happen. Um, let's see here. Do you think do you agree that Bishop's podcast sucks? Yes. <laughs> um, and that he thinks he knows what's right for the business when in reality he's living off the 83 street. He had against the Fed. So I, so to, to the fan base that follows me, I, I get very frustrated with Bishop because he, how, where does he get off? Like, he has the gall of giving advice to Tony Khan, even to, to Paul sometimes. This guy had a fucking lottery ticket, and he fucking blew it. Like, if you look at any other industry, I'm not going to go to the person that had a winning ticket and fucking drop the ball. That would be dumb of me. If I'm going to go into real estate, I'm not going to go into the guy that inherited all these properties and fucking lost them along the way from his incompetence and stupidity. But yet he has a podcast where he has the gall to give feedback and advice of something he knows nothing about. And to top it off, some of this feedback is wrong anyway. So he's still delusional after all these years. Um, And on top of everything else, like to me, everybody's allowed to make mistakes, right? Everybody's allowed to make mistakes. Um, but he's never fucking been accountable for that. Nope, ever. That's the pro- that's the problem. And that's so that because I'm uh, you know I'm I'm an ethical person that I'm always accountable for my mistakes. There's nobody that's gonna be harder on me than me. Yeah. And it, it would be nice to find people in life, especially in, in something that I've invested so much, like in professional wrestling, which is like my leisure hobby that I love. Have some accountability, bro. And then maybe if you do. Okay, I, now I could see some op- authenticity in your character, and then you could give some feedback. It would but be a, fuck- so. It would be a much interesting conversation to hear him as a guy who fucked up, and now he's saying, "Here's where I made the mistakes, and here's where I I should have learned, and I didn't." Yes, and, and he's not like. Here's what blew my mind. Do you know Tony Khan has already produced more dynamites than Eric Bischoff produced nitros? No, I did not. That stuck by me, but it makes sense when you think about that it. That is crazy. Crazy. Yes, to think about yes. Because it. it just what? felt like Nitro was hot and, and, and Raw was kind of percolating at some point in that same time frame. We, we've, I think some people forget is literally like, what, three years of, of them going at each other? Four years, maybe? So it wasn't that long of a time. And already Dynamite started in 2019 and we're already in 2024 yeah yeah and to be fair it is weird right it seems like 2019 was just yesterday yeah, totally. it was pre-pandemic which is weird to think about but yeah no it just right now you threw me that stat i'm like holy shit you're right and, and, and that's it tk has been in business longer than bishop as an authority so it's just weird to think about it that way but yet every fucking week you know this guy just keeps on giving this feedback and buries tk and another thing that i, I always make people or, or tell them to please understand is that this guy he's living his gimmick it got over there, there's there's a fan base 
and I talked to you about this. There's a lot of things to be critical of TK for. Like I've, I've been one of his biggest big fan of his booking. Me neither. But but um, but this guy has found a gimmick that suits to the people that project a lot of their insecurities onto Tony Khan. You know, because Tony Khan, for better or worse, has a look that invites projection, and and, and so Eric Bischoff found a niche with that audience. And he's fucking making money off of it. And fuck it, that's fine. But he's got no credibility with me because he's full of shit. Because he's feeding to that audience. So that's where I'm at with Bishop when it comes to all this. Yeah, I'm with you. I just I just choose not to listen. And I you know, I used to listen to Cornette, but now Cornette's a little bit too uh un PC and mean spirited. Like he's just holding grudges because people are succeeding when he said they weren't gonna succeed. So I, I just choose not to listen to those guys. And I I try and listen to things that are fair and that I that I can sort of learn from. Now, if, if Cornette's talking history, I could learn from Cornette all day long. Like, he does history better than anybody, almost. But when you talk about today's current wrestling, it's really hard on uh, for me to listen to either of those guys because current wrestling has kind of passed them by, and they want to act like it hasn't when they, they're not keeping up with it. They're, they're not watching as closely as, as even we are. The only thing that Cornette, and I don't listen to either of them anymore just because I never have time to listen to podcasts, but the only thing that Cornette has over Bishop is that Cornette is very charismatic. Bishop doesn't even have charisma, and, and, and Cornette is also, his southern humor is very funny to me, and it, it, you know, it, it, it tickles me a lot of the times. So if I had to choose, I would choose Cornette just because he's so wacky in his delivery because he did it for so many years in front of so many people, so he knows how to be, he knows how to present a good podcast even if it's filled with bullshit. Bruce Pritchard is the same way. Both of them are amazing talkers. And Bruce so, Pritchard so has all of that history working for Vince McMahon that he could just pull out. Yeah, and Paul Bosch. And, and so, um, but, but, but both of them are, are great showmen. You know, they're full of shit, but they know how to put on a show for the people. And sometimes, you know, when, when nothing's going on, that kind of, you know, I gravitate towards that from time to time. But I'm, I have the awareness of like, this is, this is all bullshit, you know? All right, let's do one more because I think we're running out of time here. Yeah, let, let's do one from the chat. Avery316 okay. wants your thoughts on Russo. Well, fuck that guy too. He's just <laughs> as bad as Bischoff. He's worse. <laughs> I think he's worse. I, I think I think Russo did a lot of damage to the business. I think he gets romanticized quite a bit. I think having a platform that he's in control of now. He's been able to spin his own narrative. And like we talked earlier, we have a lot of young fans. And, and by young, not only age-wise, but also just being wrestling fans mm -hmm. that don't have any context of history and what he's done to the business, where he get, puts himself over. And, and, and people have, he's kind of created another cult around himself. Although he doesn't, interestingly enough, he didn't have the lo lasting, the longevity like somebody like Bishop has for whatever reason, even though I think Russo is a little more charismatic than Bishop. But Russo seems to be like, nobody talks about him anymore, whereas Bishop still pops up from time to time, even though they're both full of shit. But no, I think... Can I tell you something that, that yeah. I, I fully believe? I think all of these guys who have these successful podcasts where they're very niche, Cornette even calls his a cult, like you mentioned, they are running the... Uh, the, the Donald Trump uh, 2016 playbook as far as creating a fan base and a very vocal fan base where the idea is you need to protect your hero. And part of the way that you do that is you shit on everybody else. That's the negative part, which is like, I, I'm fine if you want to, if, if Eric Bischoff has fans and he wants to promote, hey, you like me, you like what I have to say, I'll tell these stories, great. But it's the pissing on the other people big dave included where he actually gets his fans to then go into action for him and it just creates like all this negativity around the wrestling industry which it's gonna have negativity anyways the entire business is built on a lie but these guys are i don't know if it's ego or whatever but they're running like a trump playbook on an audience and it's it's just old for me. I'm just like, come on, you guys are in your 60s and you're, you know, you're you're doing stuff that kids do. So that's that's probably my biggest turnoff on everything. No, me too, and I agree with you. Everything you said, 100. percent And I think um, it's not, you know, the Trump playbook. Yeah, he he popularized it and he 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 went into office because of that. But 
it's just it's an old playbook you know that that's how you establish cults that's how you uh, that's how you have all these these quasi leaders right that, that that manipulate people into giving them their money um and, and so i yeah you're right and that's what happened my concern and i told you this years ago and it's happening like like my concern was always dave's legacy not so much his reputation his legacy because these these cult people they have for better or worse they have control of that because they're online and so the net what is the narrative online you know and then online becomes real live and you know how facts get spun so that's my concern is that they could do legitimate damage to the history of professional wrestling and how we see it and also the reputation of the people that were trying to cover it in a legit way not that i don't have anything against, I, I have a lot of issues against dave as you know but i also understand that He's probably the only, I mean, there's been a couple of people now, a lot of like Dave's disciples that have tried to be like Dave, which is good, I think, because they, you know, you, you kind of want to pass the baton, but Dave has been a guy that has tried, it hasn't always succeeded, but he's tried to be as impartial as possible and just cover the business based on facts. That's mm -hmm. all he throws, like, like, like with this whole ratings report every week, he's literally just giving you numbers. Like, why are people try to fight numbers? How the fuck are you doing that? You can't, you know? Um, and so, and so, uh, it's very frustrating. And that's my only concern. And to me, one of the reasons why I left KLB is because I was tired of that. Like, I was tired of every single fucking week you're online and it's just this nonsense. And to me, it's like, I'm a 40 year old guy that's just trying to fucking stay in love with a little piece of my childhood and right now we're in a good time to do that you know with aw being decent <laughs> and wwe being as hot as they are and it was just that negativity just fucking dragged me down yeah it's and, hard and, you can, you, it's, and it's also hard to escape it you know we've we all create our little silos of you know where we think oh you know we can create some rules and make sure we we the, the dialogue stays decent and you know i can kick people out if they're being uncivil and that's great for me but at the same time, sometimes it almost seems like I'm creating my own little ecosystem so that, you know, I'm hearing things that I want to hear and I may not be learning as much, but I'm at the point where with you, the negativity just got to me and I was like, okay, I'd rather have emotional health than, you know, than, than be sort of impartial on all of these things. I'm just going to create my own ecosystem. Right. And then with me, I know that with me, with my own little fan base, I was accused of like, well, you were in the dirt with all of us. I mean, <laughs> and, and to me, and, and, and I'll say this because I've told, I've told Danny this, like, I was like, Danny started becoming too much like that. Right. And it was like, he was very much like TK this every fucking week. And so I was like, yeah, for, for argument's sake, let's say I was in the dirt with everyone. Oh, I'm not in the dirt anymore. And I decided to get out of it. I would like some people to stand up with me. And if it didn't happen, that's fine. I'm going to remove myself from that. And that's what happened. You know, I, it, people kept on throwing it in my face like, well, what about all the shit you talk? First of all, it was like there was sarcasm and parody. But there's Jokes. also a, a joke. But there's also a point where I wanted to reel it back to just let's just talk about the business, how we sh how we, we used to talk about the business. But it was constant just hammering and hammering. And I was like, I can't do this, you know? Especially because the fucking jokes were the same every fucking <laughs> week. Like, change up the jokes at least, you know. But uh, no, even then, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have been it. So, so that's why you know I, I took a step back and I was like, I can't do this anymore. And and, and but what about this, uh, Gary? Like, I did get the, and maybe because I I stepped away, but I don't feel like it's as intense as it was even a year ago. Do you feel the same way? Uh, are you talking about the negativity? Yeah, like with AEW versus WWE, that negativity. Um. I would say that it is you're, you're probably right, but what it also may be is that I've just done a better job myself fine tuning my feeds and eliminating the really, really either tribal people or this might be even worse. The, the people who have such tunnel vision and they're actually smart. But they just want to disprove this theory that they've hung on to and they fight for that, you know, for that theory, for them not being wrong about something. And I, I think I've done a good job of, of funneling that away. But I don't know, like I because I, I, I pull myself out of it as well. So I don't know if it is or not. Uh, I, you know, I, I kind of stay away from it as much as possible. So, uh, yeah, yeah. And if this worked for you, then that's fine, because that's what I've done. And now. 
from time to time I'll peek, you know, but it, I'm not as invested as I used to be. And, and, and I love wrestling. Like, like right now, again, wrestling is amazing right now. And I'm just trying to soak it in. I don't want to be the kind of guy that looks back 10 years from now and be like, remember fucking wrestling in 2024? How hot? No, I want to enjoy it now. Yeah. You know? All right. Do you have any actually, uh, no, actually, one last thing before we move on to the last question here. Uh, um, I was actually going to go to Philadelphia because, like, you know, I took a leave of absence. So I have time. But, man, I saw those getting tickets. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm cool. I'm going to stay here. Because I was like, you know, I know enough people from, from my own little universe where I have a place to stay over there and, and, and the flights, whatever. It would have been expensive because last minute. But, man, those getting prices are, like, ridiculous. I was like, for two nights and you're looking at, like, 800 bucks, 900 bucks. I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. I'll just watch it on TV. Yeah, because you, you don't know? you don't want to sit in the euchre seats. You actually want to sit somewhere. No, I respect seat. myself. And I've always yeah. told people, you got to respect yourself a little bit. You know, if you pay your dues, I paid my dues on those euchre seats. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but one last thing. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about LA Knight now. Like if you, I don't know if you noticed, but they pulled LA Knight from TV pretty much. You know, he doesn't wrestle anymore. Um, he doesn't ever, ever since he, he, he culminated the program with, with Roman actually ever since the Royal Rumble, he's completely vanished from TV. His feud with AJ Styles is very inconsistent. Don't shoot an angle one week, take a week off. And then he was at his house, so he wasn't in the arenas. Do you think that's because of The Rock and, and the fact that they're so similar to each other? I mean, it is interesting, and it's the first thing that I thought about when The Rock came. And then, like, The, the Rock, I, I don't remember which SmackDown it was, but I saw The Rock do a promo. And then later in the show, I saw LA Knight do his gimmick, and I was like, wait. <laughs> like, this is like... Uh, a junior varsity version of the thing that it's I very similar, watched. yes. Um, but I don't know. Like I, I, I thought you know maybe they just decided that he uh, he wasn't. I don't know. Maybe metrics show that he's not as hot as he was. So they're both. I also think the AJ Styles thing because he's another cold guy, right? AJ is cold himself, and he spent his time off uh, as a cold character lifting weights. It looks like because that dude is no jacked. doing a little more than that. Yeah, it looks like I'm just saying. I'm just saying um but yeah, I, don't, um, I don't know i i i'm kind of waiting to see like did aj i mean did la knight is it an injury or did he piss off the wrong person or you know i don't know yeah because he's always been a very controversial guy he got fired about 10 years ago because he's he always rubs people the wrong way but is that because he believes in himself he's got that star aura that always rubs people in the wwe the wrong way but i will say this i would say about i don't know when he was starting to heat up um, I, I, I told, uh, I went on the KLB page and I was like, yo, this guy can't work. And, and, and he's not, he's not the kind of guy, you know, that's going to give you a, a good 15 minute match. And to be a top guy, you need to at least go 15 at a decent pace with good work rate. And this guy can't do that. So are we looking at the next Elias? Elias, we remember Elias was very charismatic. He couldn't work worth the shit. So he was gone, you know? And so I don't know if that's what's going on here, but it's just very interesting because they didn't stop promoting him when he cooled off they just he just vanished and he just i don't i don't even remember when was the last time he wrestled on tv yeah he cuts promos but it's very inconsistent you know and i and, and i just i wonder what happened there because yeah I he was know. over big time he was over and and, and, and he's they, still they, over it. they went with him too right it was we weren't sure if they were going to go with him i still am not a giant fan of the gimmick but i understand why people like it like i know like i have the uh the original right the original is something that i remember very well so when i see him it comes off as a copycat but people who didn't live through the original they think it's brand new and they're like oh wow this guy's kind of cool so i think it's also perspective it, it, how you feel yeah about no yeah for sure so we'll see we'll see what happens. i'm sure he's beating aj aj's a gatekeeper now we could safely say that right i mean aj his best years are behind him I wouldn't be surprised if this is his last run that becomes an agent. Um, I will I will put over AJ for this. He found a way to find a home in the WWE where he was one of the, the guys that Vince would have never given a second look. But he went in there, and maybe he's a good politician. He got credibility, and it seems like he's a lifer there now, which is great because I'm a huge AJ Styles fan. He was one of my favorites for years. But it seems like he's kind of like at the tail end of his career now, and he's just going to be putting guys over. And, but even as a worker, he's not that good anymore. And I'm like, yo, like, make room for another guy or whatever. Or fucking, you know, try to capture some of that youth that you used to have. 
Yeah, but he's um, so anyway, big. we'll see. He, he's so big. How can he do all of his stuff being that big? Jeez. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So. I, hope, I mean, I hope he doesn't get hurt. That's the thing that I think of immediately when I see someone blow up like that. Like, oh, that's a, you know, that's a bicep tear waiting to happen there. Him and Randall K, man. And Randall K's always hurt anyway, so Randall makes K you is a giant. AJ's a giant. Time off does does a body good, I guess. It's always been WrestleMania season too. Remember, <laughs> that's another gimmick. They always come back with those WrestleMania bodies. All right. Did you have another question? The last one, or was that it? That was it right here. Um Josh Young, but why to know about what do you think they're gonna once they go to Netflix? I like how all of a sudden the world's gonna change when they go to Netflix. Um, do you think they're going back to TV 14 or higher? Uh, what do you we, think? We talked about this on We're Live, pal. Andrew and I had Dave on. Andrew thinks that they are. I hope that they have the freedom to do it when they want. My fear is that by going TV 14, all of a sudden we just see edginess and crassness where it doesn't isn't necessary, and then it just becomes you know it comes overkill. Uh, but Dave asked. And uh, I think he believes that they're not sure right now. I don't know if he's going to report that in the Observer this week, but I think he believes that they haven't decided or have a decision on it yet. I, I my own little piece on this is that I think it's more reflection on the booking right now, just because we're we're on the road to WrestleMania. You can't um, you and, can't do Rock and Cody every week. It's just right. Like you don't have guys to do that every week, and you don't want to do it every week, anyways. Correct. And we've and we've seen from AEW that doing it every week, especially the blood, it, 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 you know, it doesn't mean anything once you can continue to do it. But no, I think this is more reflective of the Rock being in, and the Rock's gonna do whatever the fuck he wants. And then you have somebody like CM Punk, who's always gonna have that kind of attitude, so he's he's tired to do it. So I think this is more of a combination of the booking than it is some sort of new philosophy. Because I think we wouldn't have never had that memo had, had, they, had they started thinking about going to a TV-14. Um, and so I think this is more just The Rock doing what he wants. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I agree with you about that for sure. All right, let's close this with my favorite thing, which is to find little, small, wacky stories in The Observer that kind of stand out. And I'm like, what did that happen here? Okay. Do you remember uh, at the end of the Chi Town Rumble, uh, they're going off the air, and all of a sudden, there's like matches going on in the ring uh, behind yes. the announcers. Okay, so so Dave Kendall writes, Wyndham going 25 minutes. Exactly, Dave writes Kendall Wyndham and Stephen Casey. The reason why they followed the main event is most systems had the scheduled uh, had scheduled the event to go off the air at 10:48 Eastern. However. A few systems had it set for three hours. Now, this is infancy in pay-per-view, right? So some of these systems are, are different. Wacky, bro. Wacky. So they had 12 minutes to kill on some systems, but couldn't air anything important. That's why Ross and Magnum TA were talking like they'd be right back and didn't sign off before the credits because <laughs> on some systems, they came right back. Now... As to why Wyndham and Casey had to go 25 plus minutes, supposedly, is because there was so much commotion backstage because of the title change. They sit, they simply forgot that they were out there and no one gave them the <laughs> signal to finish the match. Man, can you believe that? Like, I mean, imagine being those two guys and they're like, what the fuck? Like, they're not going 25 minutes every night, so they don't even have the stamina. No. To go 25 minutes. So I, I'm imagining there was like a 10 minute chin lock there somewhere yeah, yeah, in that just match. Just headlocks and chin locks and oh, what should we do here? The fans are, have to be leaving at this point. They're like, you know, literally losing the, the crowd. Yeah, yeah. I think even the report before, it was like 400 fans left. Was like Dave gave the number. Remember, Dave used to be able to count the people. That's what he would do. Oh, yeah. Uh, which I, I, I've, I've, I've seen him do that. I, I've definitely seen him do that. <laughs> Oh, uh, so so no, yeah, it's just ridiculous, right? Like, how, but it's not. It, it's also just it shows you how much the business has evolved, even yeah. from like you know what would that be thirty four, thirty five years ago. All right. So here's another one. Buzz Sawyer and Antonio Inoki held a press conference at the Rancho Arroyo Sports Center in Sacramento. Sawyer claimed they would put up ten million dollars for Mike Tyson to fight Inoki. Almost nobody even carried the story. The reason why I like this is because even today, 
in 2024, they are still trying to get Mike Tyson to do celebrity fights. He has signed on to do a fight with Jake Paul on Netflix. I am not 100% sure this fight is actually going to happen. I still think there's a chance that somehow Tyson uh, pulls out or tries to get more money or something and uses his leverage. But we'll, we'll see. We'll see. But this is still happening. 1989, we're trying to get Tyson to fight Anoki, and now we have him uh, against Jake Paul. Oh, yeah, yeah. They tried it for years and years and years. But it's just wacky that, that Anoki chose Buzz Sawyer, of all people, to be there <laughs> with him. Try- Trying to get trying to get this match happening, this grandstand challenge, as they used to call them back in the day. Um, yeah, I know it's just I imagine it was in Sacramento, right? Yes. I, I imagine them like in the Capitol building, like you know, and, and they're just like in the stairs cutting a promo, and there's like <laughs> one cameraman and no one else. You know, it's just <laughs> yes. But All if right. you're a good promoter, which Anoki was, he would have paid some some like unhoused be, people yeah, to like people to come. Or he has a yeah, crew, yeah, he, he has a crew with him and has them change out of their uh, dojo sweatsuits and into like regular <laughs> clothes. Yes, um, Tanahashi would have been a young boy. I could think, but he would have been there fucking cheering them on. Anyways, right. what else? The Von Eric. Manny Moto is what you're getting to. Yeah. Well, I actually I don't even I didn't even put that one in there. Uh, uh, the, the, the Von Erics, we love the Von Erics on this. Oh, I love those guys. A local 140 pound high school state champ wrestler and Kerry Von Erich got into the ring. This would have been at a house show in Texas. Some swear this wasn't worked. Others say it was completely worked. But anyway, the kid could, took Kerry down a few times and made him look like an idiot. The office claimed it was worked. <laughs> Kerry was warned that doing this would make him look stupid and letting a guy half his size throw him around, but he did it anyways, and it got a big pop from the audience. So I think the story comes out in a later issue. Uh, maybe it was in a, a letter to, to Dave that uh, I think somebody no-showed maybe the main event. So Kerry was like trying to buy some time and try to you know do some stuff because they didn't ha- actually have a match, and this was mm-hmm. the result of it, but that he had this guy come in the ring and the guy just... Sh- you know, she wrestled him and took him down. And, you know, but this is like the wacky Von Eric stuff, like the one with the towel that we talked about last week. Or oh, last there's week. a lot of wacky Von Eric stuff. <laughs> um, but, but here's the thing. I wonder if at this point, because this is 1989, I wonder if the crowd is laughing at him instead of with him at this point, you know, because he, he, he towards the end, he was like this lovable guy that had like the, like, like you said, the of mice and men kind of vibe going. Yeah. Um, and and also it's not fair because he was missing a foot, so the other guy had a had an advantage. He did. He had two fully developed feet to work off of. So you know, in a way, he cheated. All right, last one, and another one of my faves because he's in this one a lot. King Haku. Yes. Was arrested once again this past week after a brawl in Rochester, New York, according to the newspaper reports. Haku was insisting to a girl in a bar that she bowed down in servitude to him and she refused. And a scene occurred where the girl's boyfriend showed up and Haku banged the boyfriend's head into another guy's head before police arrested him. Haku was involved in another bar incident in Baltimore some months back where he uh, allegedly bit off the nose of someone he was involved in a fight. He with. loves to bite off those noses. He's got a collection of them. I mean, can you imagine being in a bar and this dude who, I mean, Haku looks like he means business. He's not someone who's going to sneak up on you. And, and you know, He's a very thick guy, yes. Very thick. He just looks menacing. And he's like, I, I'm King Haku. Do you watch WWF? And this girl's like, no, not really. And he's like, no, but you have to bow. And she's like, no, I'm, I'm good. And he's like, no, you really have to bow. And then the boyfriend comes over, and he's just like, Conk, like get out of here! No, no, but knowing, knowing the knowing the way the boys were back then, he didn't even give her context. I could just picture him <laughs> saying, "Bow down to the king," like with no context whatsoever. Um, and then the boyfriend comes in. Now here's where it gets wacky. Uh, on top of everything else, Haku had options to ram this guy's head. He had the wall, he had the table, but he chooses another guy's head to do. <laughs> He's like. He in his mind, he was here hearing Gorilla Monsoon go double noggin knocker. The double noggin knocker. Um, uh, one thing that will always pop me about Haku is that 
he again i said it last time he was only a king for a few months but he squeezed that king name for the rest of his life because everybody still refers to him as king haku yeah. and and it's like yo you were only a king for like two three months and jim Dugan <laughs> beat you um and and another thing about haku i believe his stories because nobody has ever stepped up and say they whooped his ass usually with all these tough guys not even Dave. And if you notice, Dave always talks with a lot of respect about Haku as well. Uh, and, and so to me, it's like, yeah, there's some validity to a lot of his stories because usually with these tough guys, there's always somebody that humbles you. And, th and that's kind of like the end of the story. But with Haku, it's like nobody. Nobody has ever... And even the tough guys, Dan fucking Severn has stated that Haku's the most... And he didn't even work with them at the same time. You know? Uh, the, the Haku came in the perfect time. He was... 10 years before anything MMA related got really big. So he's got this rep. And then by the time MMA comes and look, I've been to bars where you look around and you're like, okay, one of these guys is training at a local gym and you, nobody better mess with this dude. We just don't know which one it is. Cause that's when you don't know who it is, then it's really scary. Uh, but yes, you know, how could, by the time, MMA became popular and all, you know, you had somebody who knew what they were doing at every bar. Haku was retired. He's done. So he didn't have to. Well, not really, because remember, Bishop wanted to throw him in there in the early days. And Haku made some sort of, very smartly of him, he made some sort of excuse not to go. Well, yeah, but in because 90, he learned that there was no biting. He's like, I'm out. Yeah, 93, 94, 95, when he was mean, that was the early days of UFC. And I feel like he would have fit right in because you had to, all the street fighters were, were doing it at that time. Um, but he said he didn't want to. Um, how he would have done, we'll never know. But uh, maybe he needed him. Shawn Michaels needed him when he got attacked by all of the 25 oh Marines in Syracuse. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I don't think uh, Haku would have done well because his reputation wasn't based on technique. His reputation was based on like the sugar hold kind of stuff where you're like tearing guys eyeballs out and you're like fish hooking them. Like that's what his reputation. So was you think Hoyce Gracie would have mounted him and put him out. And well, like... if he, if Haku had to fight with rules, then yeah, he probably wouldn't have fared very well. But if it was like no rules, he would have done excellently. Cause he knew all the, all the, <laughs> the, the hooking and stuff. So by the I'm way, trying to think... go ahead. I, I was going to say, before we get out of here, you need to check out this book, uh, Ballyhoo. Have you seen this book? No, but I'm going to write it down right now. It's it's pretty expensive. I think I still had to pay like 30 bucks for it, but I just bought it because I was like, I want to read it. But it goes back to the late 1800s uh, about pro wrestling and uh, post gold rush and this promoter coming out to San Francisco and such. So that's where I am in the book. But it's awesome how it how how wrestling comes out of boxing and and you know that oh i of, love that stuff you know you know i love that stuff a, i love it it's, it's amazing anybody listening to this uh i'll put the uh, i'll put the link in the in in the show notes if i remember as well but uh yeah but ballyhoo it's awesome you're you'll love I'm, it. I'm probably gonna pick it up i think that's worth it that, that price is a little steep but it's worth it for that information especially on um, your on your travels if you're gonna be doing traveling and you gotta you yeah know, you want something to read that it's it's gonna be good for you for that I was able to get a hooker for relatively cheap. That that you know, you're paying like hundreds of dollars now for that book, but I have it. Um, and then I I have Chokehold by Jim Wilson, which is something that I've been wanting to read for a while because uh, uh, some of the old um, observers from Dave, um, he talks about how much of a fan he is of that book because that book Jim Wilson covers a lot of the scandals from like the the 60s and the 70s of the NWA, which is something that there's not a lot of stuff on that, you know. So that's another book that I bought. And I'm going to start reading it soon as well. That was, uh, I, I mean, we didn't pitch this to anybody, but uh, we, we kind of did an on-air pitch for uh, Dark Side to cover that time frame of Jim Wilson and uh, what you call the guy who's going into the uh, WWE Hall of Fame. Um, oh, Thunderbolt Patterson. Thunderbolt, yeah. They were kind yeah. of in the same circles on, on the same stuff. So, yeah, that I, I pitched. I was like, they should actually do the Jim Wilson story. That would be really so, but before we leave, one more thing. Just the hypocrisy of the WWE. Now, I could, I could be a fool if they, if they announce this in the next few days. But ever since they fired Dana Warrior, where's the Warrior Award? Like, come on. you know. I, mean, I hope they realize that the Warrior Award was actually sort of a, a negative thing to, to name it after that guy. I mean, they should. Oh, I think it was. They should refurnish it. You know, maybe name it after. You know, like 
the date like big dave did he named it after a uh, shad gas shad gas part yeah yeah they, sh they should do something like that change it change the meaning of of that award to, to somebody who actually did some good but it seems like they're complete like, completely skipping that in the celebrity wing this year so maybe paul doesn't like that yeah like fuck all that you it know? is right it is this year so we'll see and i saw that uh mike rotunda said He's, they're actually happy that Bray is not inducted this year because it's just less stressful and I'm sure less emotional. And maybe we maybe Bray actually gets inducted next year instead. Yeah, I don't think I don't I don't even see how he could hold it together. I mean, this just happened in August, you know, and, and so it's like seven, eight months ago. And, and for him to be inducted, I'm sure they would have asked Mike to be the presenter and he would have just been a complete mess. I, I can't so you could stop. I, I saw the same interview you're talking about and you could tell that. He was relieved just not to have to worry about it this year, you know? Yeah, I, I would. I, I'm with him, man. If if that, you know, not that I would be in that situation or, or I hope I'm not in that situation, but po postpone that thing until, you know, he can he can have some sort of distance from from that situation. So, yeah, even next year might be too soon. Might you be, never know. Might be. I mean, I think that documentary is going to be very emotional. I can't you know wait. I, mean? I, I don't really like WWE Peacock documentaries, but I can't wait for it. I, I'm excited for it. Yeah. So. All right, man. Thank you right. for having me and doing this. All right. Next month, we'll cover the two shows, the two Super Sunday shows. And then it's kind of this post. The, the now This is going to be really interesting. The post-WrestleMania uh, WWE schedule because... No Holds Barred is going to be coming out. Survivor Series is is with Zeus and Savage. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, SummerSlam. Then Survivor Series as well. Then we get this big cage match for the pay-per-view debut of the yes. No Holds Barred. That's a wacky time period. And it drew really good business for them. So We're going we're gonna to do some mental gymnastics and try to make sense of Tiny Lister <laughs> you know, crossing universes and attacking Hogan and not Rip. Yes. You know, so it's, it's that's going to be fun to try to make sense out of all that. Yeah, it's but not, uh, it's not like it was Tiny Lister who attacked the Hulk. It was Zeus, the character who attacked Hogan. Yes, but <laughs> Zeus has no. But Zeus shouldn't have any beef with Hogan because it wasn't Hogan. You should who love him Hogan in the movie. For, for putting him in the movie. <laughs> Dave, Dave, so, yeah. has, so, Dave has some early reviews of No Holds Barred, though, in the in the ones that we. Read. I read it. I read them. Yeah. So I'm sure I can't wait for his overall review of No Holds. Barred. He said it wasn't released. It escaped or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for doing this. I know we we went a little bit longer, but I thought it was uh, really good stuff. So, uh, for Draven, I'm Double G. We will see you when we see you. Peace out. Bye. Bye.